Star off the roll call, please. Good morning, Commissioners. District 1, Commissioner Chernock. Present. District 2, Commissioner Hampton. Present. Thank you. District 3, Commissioner Herbert. Present. District 4, Commissioner Forsyth. Present. District 5, Chair Shadid. Present. District 6, Commissioner Carpenter. Present. District 7, Commissioner Wheeler Reagan. District 8, Commissioner Blair. Present. District 9, Commissioner Sleeper. Dist okay. District 10, Commissioner Housewright. District 11, Commissioner Epler. District 12, vacant. District 13, Commissioner Hall. Here. District 14, Commissioner Kingston. Here. And place 15, Vice Chair Rubin. I'm here. Thank you. You have quorum, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Today is Thursday, September 19th, 2024, 9, 10 a.m. Welcome to the briefing of the Dow City Plan Commission. Uh, this is just a time for commissioners to ask questions uh, of staff. And uh, we will keep all our, uh, all our comments to the hearing this afternoon, beginning at 1230. Uh, commissioners, we're going to go ahead and jump right into the docket. Just an FYI, we're going to uh, brief all the D7 cases at the end. Now, Commissioner Wheeler, some time to, to get in this morning. And uh, with that, we'll begin with case number one. Z223220. And I believe that case is going to come off consent. Good morning. Good morning, Mr. Pepit. Hi. Okay. Time to go. So this is Z223220. And it's located in Southwest Dallas, South I 20. So it's an application for an MF2 multifamily district on property zoned and NSA, Neighborhood Service District with D restrictions, and an AA Agricultural District on the north line of West Camp Wisdom Road between Clark Road and Royal Cedar Way. So 4.83 acres, and the purpose of the request is to permit residential uses on the site. Here's the site as it exists today. Here is the existing and surrounding zonings, TH to the east, um, PD multifamily to the northwest, uh, outside of city limits to the south, and there's single family in the TH zoning to the east. And so it is that neighborhood service district currently undeveloped. Uh, they're proposing residential uses. Existing deed restrictions uh, will remain in place. They shouldn't interfere with what they're trying to do um, since they don't affect residential uses. <laughs> Additionally, along a major road, MF2 is more appropriate uh, within walking distance to educational services, transit, retail, move right along. Here's the site as it exists today. And I'll move east. A little bit. Also looking at the site, all from Camp Wisdom. Looking east, outside city limit, to the south, and there's uh, multifamily to the northwest. And then east, there's, re there's retail further down Camp Wisdom. Here's the site as it exists today. Uh, as for the development standards, um, there's a few things that act on this site. Um, in that affected in a uh, way different than typical multifamily. They've got a significant front step back because of their block face continuity from the ag district on the block. Uh, there's residential proximity slope projected onto this uh, limit, limits height they'll have to comply with uh, under the MF2 or any other district and staff recommendation is approval. Questions, Commissioners? Commissioner Hall, please. Mr. Pepe, uh, they want multifamily. What, what type of multifamily? It would be uh, a part, I think it's a single building apartment, is what they're approving or uh, proposing. Just apartments, no, no townhomes or in? I suppose, I think they have a, um, where, where their height is a little bit more limited, uh, they propose like what maybe look like townhomes, but they're, you know, they're all together on one lot. They're multifamily from a, a code perspective. But uh, I think that there is a smaller 
portion that's proposed outside of the main thing. With that said, they're not tied to a single concept under a general zoning district. Okay. Are, are, are you aware that we're getting quite a few letters in opposition and they're bringing up things like uh, a creek and drainage issues? And I am. Okay. Uh, is, is there anything you can say about that at this point? Or? Those have to be handled during the, the platting and engineering phases that come after this. Uh -huh. They have to comply with all the regulations that are required. Uh, can't get into too much detail, but all of that is required to be handled after that point. Um, based on the zoning map, a portion of it is considered under the geologically similar area, uh, which whichever the um, escarpment is associated with, but they have to go through additional uh, review. So they, they do have significant drainage review that has to occur after this point. Okay. But we, and, can't, we can't determine what that is at this phase. And just one final thing. Um, I, I was just curious that why this was on consent, because it seemed like a big change from neighborhood services to, to multifamily, and then there was, there was quite a few issues with it. it consent, I mean, it can come off consent if, if anyone is in opposition or if the commission chooses so. I mean, it's just mainly staff is in approval of the case, and there's no disalignment between the uh, applicant and staff in the request, so it can stay on consent by our practice. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Herbert. Yes. Um, first, <clears throat> can we take this off of consent? And uh, the next question is: um, in the in the plan, there was talks about preserving a lot of the acreages of land. Uh, are you aware of that? Is that a part of your evaluation? No, it's not a part of our evaluation. We know they intend; you know, they've stated their intent to uh, have conservation easements and other things uh, to the north. Not part of our assessment because it's not tied to the zoning case in any way. Uh, there are certain requirements for drainage and tree preservation that they have to meet. That's one thing they could do to meet those. Uh, but that doesn't play into the evaluation because they're, they're not linked. It's a general zone change that okay. doesn't have those tools. Thank you. And the uh, five floors were mentioned um, on this site, one building, five floors. Um, where this building is, will residential proximity or the other things you mentioned um, reduce that height? Residential proximity slope is going to act on the site from the east. There's TH zoning to the east. And that's going to project residential proximity slope. Uh, the applicant may be able to describe better uh, with their diagrams where their building meets, but that was obviously a, um, a concern in terms of, hey, can you meet the requirements of code? Uh, as a result, they can. So that at a rate of uh, one to three, it's projecting from the east to the west across this property and limiting their, their height. Max height of, of multifamily two is just 36 feet. Um, when they use a mixed income bonus or if they include mixed income housing, they can increase their height uh, depending upon how much housing is put in. If that's five, 10, 15%, they can increase it from 51, 66, 85. That increase does not include RPS, RPS acts on on top of that bonus, it negates uh, where it does strike the uh, proximity slope. So point being is they are limited by proximity slope. I know they, as their building's in the middle of the site, uh, they'd only be able to get to 75 feet, for example, okay. if they were 225 feet. I tried to do it in my head there for a second, but I determined it was not for the best. So they, they could only get to for 75 feet in height, for example, if they, yes, are 20, 225 feet from the eastern property line. Okay, and underground parking was mentioned. Do you know how many floors of underground parking? Is it just one? No, I, I don't know. We'll I don't talk. know okay. anything about that. And that wasn't included in the five floors, right? It's five it floors of be, actual. No, it wouldn't be included in stories. Um, it would only, you know, the height is really what's at play here, or height is really what's limited here. So if their parking was partially above ground and bumps up their height, then that it only, it's the only time it plays into, uh, into account with that. But they're not held to above or below in the zoning. Okay, um, last, uh, maybe last. Um, the, the area um, that's being conserved is behind this property. To the north, yes. Right, so with that being said, traffic, plans have been submitted. I reviewed them. 
whether I agree with them is another story, but um, will fire and engineering, I mean fire and police be able to get to that area in case there's ever a fire or anything like that? It, it's, would that be considered um, in permitting or in engineering at some point? Yeah, the, the building itself, the facility that's being developed is gonna have to have uh, fire lanes depending on the height um, that run within the site. Uh, mm -hmm to a certain distance to achieve uh, their, their hose reach. As for the properties to the north, I don't think that typically, and I'm speculating, but I don't think that typically conservation areas or, or natural areas or open space uh, have requirements for things like fire lanes and access. Uh, I can check with engineering to see if there's a, a concrete answer on that, but I would, in, like any open space, uh, they wouldn't have a fire lane requirement because first of all, they're not developing it. Gotcha. Um, so but the I development have, itself will have significant fire lane requirements on its own okay. side. So they have mentioned going in and clearing the brush and making that creek walkable and livable. Um, will they ever have to come for zoning for that or will the conservation zoning um, cover them for that, that section of their development? Yeah, I would, again, speculate. I hadn't heard about that, but okay. I would, Without a structure or a defined use, they would likely not need to change a zoning under ag zoning. Okay, okay, thank you. Commissioner Hanton, please. Thank you. Um, Commissioner Herbert covered a couple of my questions, trying to understand um, how the site was proposed to be developed, any protections um, relative to the adjacent creek. Is there a difference uh, between in Article 10 between the two zoning districts that are being proposed? There so should the existing NS versus no. The there should NS. not be. There should not be because generally your your mandatory requirements of Article 10 say single family and duplex uses and then all other uses. Okay. So your Article 10 requirements are the same. And Tree preservation versus uh, on site landscaping same. And so is there any discussion with the applicant or consideration? It sounds like they've talked about improvements, activating the creek, using it as an amenity for the site. Is that, That's clearly nothing that's before us as a straight zoning change. Is that something that's been reviewed and is being discussed in other city departments or through other channels? I think they'd have to answer that. Uh, we don't have a tool in zoning to do that, uh, either outside of the area request or within a general zoning district. They could speak to that if they've um, pursued that with other departments or um, have other ways they'd like to, to put that on the record, uh, but it's not gonna be associated with the zoning case. All right, and then final question. I noticed that the deed restriction said that there's no change, but the uses that are defined in that are not allowed in MF2. Are they proposed to be removed or they're just carrying forward with the proposed request? Yeah, you, you, so the restrictions that exist on the site are just general merchandise or food store, uh, less than 3,500 is prohibited and motor vehicle fueling station is prohibited. Presumably those were put in place with the uh, NS district. I mean, they were put in place when, they, when a commercial district went in here. And no, they, they would not affect the multifamily. Uh, they chose not to terminate them for whatever reason, uh, but they'll, they'll remain uh, so if it ever were, uh, if it, so either if it remains in commercial district or if it ever were to be a commercial district future. in the future or a mixed use district or something like that, those uses would still be prohibited. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Commissioner Forsyth, please. Thank you, Chairman Shudi. Um Is uh, this uh, creek area uh, for this property in a flood zone? Sorry. Um, yes, there's a portion of the of the creek is uh, designated as floodplain at this time. Do you know what the designation is? Is it a hundred year floodplain? Could you? What What is the designation? Oh, which a, uh, type of floodplain? Yeah, I'm yeah. I'm sorry, I don't I don't know that off the top of my head. If it's a 100 or uh, less, I think the blue. I I, I do think the blue is uh, 100 year on this map as shown. That's, that's my understanding as well. Um, is there a retaining wall that's going to uh, have to be built in order to level the property along the creek side? So, uh, so there's various things one can do to accommodate uh, drainage issues. 
Um, you know, typically you can't build typical structures in the floodplain uh, without improve, improving it, uh, modifying it, uh, so that the floodplain is either no longer there or it accommodates the, the structures. A retaining wall is one is one approach uh, that's possible. That has to be assessed during platting and permitting as they uh, move through the process. What type of um, what type of improvement or structure they need to, to accommodate that flood area, uh, but they do have to do it. They have to improve drainage through the site, not worsen it. They have to uh, build out of the floodplain or build with the floodplain whenever uh, it applies. So they'll have to build something that would probably be a drainage, drainage uh, a retaining wall in order to you know accommodate the drainage issues on this property. If, if they're building near the floodplain, if they're building farther from it, then that wouldn't apply or be necessary. And that's open to them in a general zoning case. And um, earlier you said the, um, the RPS would allow the site, uh, the project to be 75 feet tall. Is that right? Yeah, so I was just throwing out an example of doing... 33s, and so they can actually only get to that height. So RPS is a is a negative force, not a, a positive force in terms of heights, um, meaning it detract it detracts uh, rights that are potentially there. Uh, it doesn't add them, obviously. Uh, so the base height for multifamily two is 36 feet. They can only increase the height as they introduce mixed income housing as part of the base uh, MF two, you know, and that's five percent, ten percent. 15%, so, so. So let me clarify. You're saying that the zoning actually then that they're, that they're requesting would only allow for 36 feet height uh, building? <clears throat> That's the base height. If they include 5% mixed income housing, it's 51. If they include 10, it's 66. If they include 15%, that's 85 feet. However, RPS detracts from that. That's listed in the uh, development standards chart in the report, but uh, RPS counteracts that. So if, if, even if they did 10, you know, for example, 10% at um, the middle income band of mixed income housing, they get 66 feet in height, but the asterisk there is that RPS still detracts height off of that. So if they're on the east side of the property, they're going to lose height regardless of housing uh, inclusion. Do you, do you know what the total height is for the uh, the building that they're proposing at this site? I don't. I know that I know the maximum heights that are um, allowed by the zoning district. So, 36, 51, 66, 85 minus RPS. Commissioner Blair. I'm going to um, follow some of the questions from, from Commissioner Forsythe when it comes down to this being a 100-year floodplain. Um, wouldn't it be a requirement for them to be for this lot to be raised outside of the floodplain in order to build on it? Correct. Presumably, not all of it. It's a small portion of the site that is located within the floodplain. It's the eastern side is located in the floodplain only. I wish this were a, a more readable map, um, but it's only the eastern part of the floodplain, so not the entire lot would have to be lifted from it. Um, it's just the eastern side? It's just the eastern side. But wouldn't that still be required to, to be brought out of the floodplain in order for it to be developed? Yes, but, but you, you may not want to develop in that portion. You may leave it low and let water flow where it is, through there, what have you. So. They will not be able to build in the floodplain portion if they really wanted to, which usually cost is the uh, is the uh, prohibitor there. Uh, they'd have to build up out of it or improve the floodplain so that it is not an issue. Um, so it's a small small portion of the site in the east is the floodplain. Uh, so they may want to develop other portions of the site because of uh, that's easier. Uh, but if they did want to do anything in the east, they'd have to work around the floodplain or improve it, improve flow or build um, out of it. Any of those things are available to them. So you, 
you, it was, did I not hear and understand that they would be doing a conservation area when it comes down to the creek? Is that the area they're doing the conservation area in? Yeah, nothing is um, bound to this case, so I don't want to guarantee anything, but my understanding is that it's actually mainly, uh, if, if not that, the applicant can answer that question, but also the parcel to the north potentially, uh, but the applicant we may be able to speak to that more. So this property is also right on top of a existing creek, is that not correct? Ex ex on top of a what? <laughs> I'm sorry, <laughs> I said well, neither of us heard each other. Um, on top of an existing what you said? Creek, yes, so there's the floodplain on the east. I understand that there's a drainage easement on the east side and the and, and the west side, um, they would have to work with those when they get to plotting and permitting. So they'd either have to build around them, um, address those through the proper means that go with plotting and permitting, um, or like I said, avoid them. Well, do you know if anyone from engineering will be available this afternoon in order for additional questions to be asked? Yes, I'll, I'll let him know for sure. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions on this item, commissioners? Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Pepe. Back to case number two, please. Spurches, good morning. Good morning. This is case Z234-212. And it's the application for an amendment to a specific use permit number 2221 for a studio tattoo studio used on property zone sub district 1A within plan development district number 621, the old Trinity and design district on the south line of Levy Street between Manufacturing Street and Express Street. The purpose of the request is to continue the use to continue a use of a tattoo studio on the property. This is the location map, the area map, and the zoning map. You will see that it is surrounded by other office showroom warehouse uses, and then also the levee and the Trinity River Greenbelt. On January 11, 2017, the Dallas City Council approved the specific use permit number 2221 for its tattoo studio, and the applicant applied to renew the specific use permit number 2221 on April 18, 2024. The next few slides will be of the site and the surrounding area. So this is on site. This is looking south, looking south, looking directly across the street, looking north. And as you will see, here is the site plan. Nothing about the site plan has changed. Instead, recommendation is approval subject to the site plan and conditions. Questions, commissioners? Okay, thank you very much. Uh, commissioners will come back to item number three. We'll go to number four. Ms. Bridges. This is case number Z234-227. It's the application for a removal of the D1 liquor control overlay on property zone in MU1 mixed use district with a D1 liquor control overlay with the special use permit number 1933. The purpose of the request is to allow alcohol sales on the property. 
The location map, the area map, the zoning map, you will see that the site is surrounded by single family, undeveloped land, mixed use, residential as well. The area request is zoned by MU1 and is developed with a motor vehicle fuel uh, station in conjunction with a general merchandise fuel store, 3,500 square feet or less. The property includes a specific use permit for alcohol sales, which it has had since 2012. Um, the motor vehicle fueling station was constructed in 2011, is approximately 1,854 square feet, and the lot has access on both South Zang and West Suffolk. The applicant requests to remove the D1 look control overlay and in a D1 look control overlay, a person shall not sell or serve alcohol sales, beverages or setups for alcohol beverages for consumption off the premises unless the sale or service is part of the operation of a use, which is a specific use permit has been granted by the city council. This is on site, on site as well. I'm just standing across the street. On site, on site as well. These are surrounding uses and staff recommends approval. Questions, Commissioner Carper. Yes, I, I'm not following the rationale for the staff's recommendation for approval because all I see here to justify it is just the applicant's desire not to have to have an SUP. And I mean, I would imagine that everyone in the city who is required to have an SUP would prefer not to. So um, can, can you elaborate a little bit on this and do you have any uh, information as to whether the SUP they have is currently current. Are they current on their 12B convenience store inspections or the crime statistics? I'm just, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to find a reason to justify removing this. Well, I do not have the uh, crime statistics for that. However, um, they are current on their SUP and then they are wanting to remove the D1 look control overlay because the use of motor vehicle fueling station is allowed. They just want to be able to uh, sell the alcohol. I understand that, but you know, I, I guess I'm trying to figure why we would uh, determine why we would remove the um, D1 overlay here just because the applicant desires to and not do something similar for every other, you know, gas station convenience store that sells alcohol. There is a, a gas station further down the street, a QT, and they are able to sell alcohol. Is that because the boundary of the overlay is in between those properties? Yes, ma'am. Okay. All right. I, all right. Thank you. You're welcome. Commissioner Hampton. Just one follow up on that. You mentioned the adjacent um, property that um, has this by right. Are they part of a um, regional retail district? Um, and do they also have the residential adjacency that appears to exist here? I will have to check that to see what that particular zoning is. Okay. I can thank get you. back with you on that. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Commissioner Chernoff. But so I wasn't clear. Did the did the applicant give any reason for the for the, give a reason why they filed this? Yes, they want to be able to they want to be able to sell alcohol. Right now, they can't um, because of the D one overlay. So they just want to remove that overlay to ensure that they can sell alcohol. Everything else will remain the same. Can, can I clarify something? If they have the D1 liquor overlay, they can sell alcohol with an SUP. Right, but they already have the SUP. So now they're back to remove that D1 overlay. So they already are selling alcohol under an SUP. I'll have to look at the SUP to see, but when I did my site visit, I didn't see any alcohol there. But I'll have to check the SUP and see. So what is the existing SUP for? Oh, I'm happy to weigh in. Yeah, actually, this body approved the last iteration of the SUP in, let's, it was February. And so that was the last uh, time they came up for renewal. Um, they've been out in operation with an SUP since 2011, tw excuse me, 2012. Um, so I understand that's part of why they've, uh, they've requested to remove it as they've had an SUP for uh, several years and they request to, to not get SUP every uh, repeating period. Um, as for the question was, yeah, the SUP is for alcohol sales that they have at this time. Uh, so that has been in place since 2012 uh, and then renewed most recently this year. Uh, as for the 
there was this talk about a re regional retail site with a quick trip. That site, it is uh, regional retail, but it doesn't have, or excuse me, it doesn't have a overlay. Um, and so your alcohol sales don't differ from district to district in, in regards to um, just alcohol sales within a store or within a restaurant. Uh, those are more governed by the, the overlays like this one. Can we take this off and say? Please, yes. Commissioner House Rep, please. How much time did we give them on that SUP we approved in February? That's a great question. I believe it was five, Commissioner. Yes, five. Five years. Any other questions on this item, commissioners? Okay, we'll move to case number five. Thank you, Ms. Burgess. Uh, uh, commissioners, case number five will be held under advisement to October 10th. We'll brief it then. We'll brief it then. Takes us to number six, uh, to Mr. Clinton. I've got to step up. Good morning. Good morning. This is case number Z234-252. It's an application for an R5A single family district on property zoned in RR Regional Retail District. The Greater North Oak Cliff Demolition Delay Overlay located on the northwest side of East 9th Street between Celeriga Place and North Denver Avenue. The purpose of the request is to rezone the property to MF1 multifamily district to allow single family residential uses and it's approximately 5,227 square feet in total size. A uh, quick background on the site. Again, it's uh, currently zoned regional retail. It's undeveloped uh, vacant lot. This lot has frontage only on East 9th Street, uh, ge geographically uh, located in Southwest Dallas, about three miles from downtown. Uh, there have been two zoning cases in the immediate area within the last five years, and applicant is requesting a general zoning change. Here is our location map. This is our aerial map. Here's the zoning map with the surrounding uses. Uh, once again, the current site is regional retail. To the north, there's also regional retail and single family. To the east, south, and west, also single family. I do want to point out that um, although it's single family uses, it is zoned MF2. Here we are on site uh, looking at the uh, looking northwest. Here we're on site looking west. This is on site looking northeast. And here we have some images of the surrounding uses. This is immediately west of the site. This is adjacent to the site uh, to the south. This is adjacent to the site to the southeast. And this is to the immediate east of the site. Of the site. Um, brief development standards. So uh, the existing uh, standards, 15 foot front yard setback, 20 foot side and rear adjacent to residential. Um, the height, uh, you can go up to 70 feet, five stories. And for the proposed, uh, the front setback would be the same, 15 feet. Uh, for the side and rear, it would be um, 10 or 15 feet, uh, depending on the adjacencies, since the adjacency, the adjacencies are single family, um, there is uh, none required. The max height will be 36 feet. 
uh, uh, staff analysis. So the existing surrounding residential uses uh, are zoned, again, zoned multifamily, but they are single family uses. Uh, the request does fit within the immediate area. Um, and it also complies with uh, policies of various uh, area plans. Therefore, staff's recommendation is approval. Thank you, sir. Questions? Commissioner Hall. Thank you, Mr. Clinton. Um, when I, I reviewed the case, I just scribbled some notes here. Uh, it, they want to, they're requesting multifamily, but it, I think, did I read correctly that what they're actually going to build is a 28-foot a tall single family home? That's correct. Uh, so that confused me. If they're going to build a single family home, why did they request multifamily? That's a good question. So I think because of the existing uh, the existing zoning in the area, they wanted to fit that uh, fabric in the again the existing zoning in the immediate area. So to the west, south, and east of the site are uh, multifamily zones, but single family uses. Hmm. Well, my first thought when I read that was, is this going to be a duplex or you know? But it said single family home, so. Yes, so the applicant did uh, assure me that they are only interested in doing a single family home, 28 feet max height. Um, I th believe they will be here, so if you have further questions about their intentions, you can ask them. Okay, thank mm -hmm. you. Thank you. Commissioner Carpenter, followed by Commissioner Hampton. Now, I I'm having uh, trouble with the MF zoning myself. If the development pattern is single family and they want to build single family and 28 um, feet, you know, there's no deed restriction or anything here. MF would allow them to build 36 feet. Um, why wouldn't this work under an R zoning and be more compatible with the built environment? Uh, great question. So I believe that, uh, again, the applicant wanted to match the existing uh, zoning uses in the area, but additionally, there would be a block phase continuity that would come into play. So regardless of which, if uh, the applicant went with a R zoning, they would have to meet the um, the uh, front yard setback of the immediate adjacent uh, zones. Thank you. Commissioner Chernock? If this was, um, if the application was for R75, would you have denied it? made a recommendation for denial? Mm, I'm not sure. I can't really speak to that. I think I would have to evaluate the case a little bit more if that was the original request. Commissioner Hampton, or Commissioner Chernock. One just more. one more question. So um, just to clarify my understanding, our zoning code is progressive in the sense that whatever zoning class um, a property is designated at they can always they always have the choice to to do essentially less dense less dense or less more uh, less intrusive structures I guess you could say less restrictive so, less restrictive so any multifamily property always has the option to do r75 up to up to what zone mf1 mf2 I believe MF1, and we didn't go MF2 or MF3 because it's more intensive. More intensive. So then that way it would restrict, because of residential proximity slope, it would restrict the heights um, drastically right. due to the immediate adjacencies. And just to clarify, you guys were talking about districts, but um, what you're really talking about is uses. So the multifamily districts allow single family uses as well as duplex and multifamily uses whereas an R75A district would only allow single family. Um, another important thing to note, because most of the zoning in this area is MF2, even though, as Laquan noted, it's single family uses, if you had an R district right here in the center of this block, that would become a site of origination for RPS um, for all of the adjacent um, MF zoned lots. Um, so that could be problematic, uh, perhaps, for some of the existing structures on those lots. So if it was MF1, the proximity slope would just, it would be a 45, it'd be one to one? Yeah, so uh, an MF district to an MF district does not create RPS. Uh, an R district to an MF district would, 
uh, an MF district to a non-residential district would, um, but MF to MF doesn't trigger RPS. Commissioner Hampton? Well, that goes to the heart of what I guess I'm trying to understand is the existing zoning, and there's a pretty large rectangle, is regional retail, which does not allow any residential uses, but there are residential uses on the ground today. Is that correct? No, it's undeveloped. I know this one is, but the surrounding area, mm. per all of your um, site photos, and, but am I, I guess, let me start with a fundamental question. Does regional retail allow residential uses? No. Thank so you. there are, but regional retail is just this lot. Again, the immediate surrounding area is all MF. There is some I'm sorry, RR I'm, zoning. I'm on, to the, I'm on 614 of our case report. I see a very large rectangle that has an RR. So is that RR only this site? And the, and the designation is kind of floating? No, the RR zoning currently applies to this lot, um, and there are some other lots along this street here at this intersection that are RR zoning. Um, but then if you go outside that one tract of RR zoning, it's largely MF2A. No, and, and I see all that. I don't, can you pull up page 614? Because I guess I'm struggling a little bit just to understand. I, I'm clear that what's on the ground is allowed um, single family uses within MF2 zoning. So it's a lower density than what's allowed. Understand all that, but I'm trying to understand what's the immediate proximity to this site. So I, that black rectangle that we see on 614 of our case report, it appears. So we've got red, which is our site, and then that larger rectangle where you've got the regional retail. Is that entire rectangle regional retail? That's correct. And, and then um, as you- Existing single family uses generally. Yes, which are non-conforming uses uh, under the current zoning. Understood. Probably yes. our history of cumulative zoning, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, under, I'm very well familiar with that. Thank you. Um, so for this site, <laughs> with the zoning change to MF2, or whether MF1 or whatever it may be, MF1 is the request before us today, it will impose residential proximity slope on those adjacent properties. That's correct. And if you look at the remainder of this block face as you move to the northeast, I can't see what that street is. It's the red two-story um, image that was in the case report. Right. Immediately adjacent. And that yeah, I I, that you. is MF2 zoning. Um, those uh, horizontal lots to the northeast, those are MF2, I think, with deed restrictions. Um, but that is all MF zoning. So the remainder of this block face is residential. It's just um, this tract uh, of zoning here with the uh, black rectangle uh, along this street that is RR zoning. And so it appeared that the northeast property that's MF2 with deed restrictions is a side yard, because there was a question about block face continuity and what might be triggers um, with this request. But if that's considered a side yard, this would be the front yard for this property based on its orientation. So well, the, yeah, I'm, I actually had that question too about the lots to the Northeast that have the deed restrictions. Um, I know they're oriented the way they are, but I'm not sure if the front yard would actually be um, They the may have met the front there. yard requirement even though it's functionally right. the side yard. Right, right, right. Okay, understood. Um, yeah, I, I believe that's probably a shared access development or, or something like that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Clinton. Just a couple of follow-up questions there. One, I think there was some reference of a, whether this could be zone R75. This is 5,500 square feet, so it's not a lawful build. For, it would not be a lawful build site under R75, right? Uh, the total size is 5,200 square feet. 52, yeah. Um, and no, it would not. Okay, so you, you could do R5, and just to follow up on Commissioner Hampton's question, a R5 district has a 20-foot side yard, front yard setback, right? That's correct. Okay, so that would impose a... If, if block face continuity applies, that would impose a minimum 20 foot 
front yard setback to all lots fronting along the street. Yes. Right. And assuming those MF lots had front yards along 9th Street, the 15 foot front yard setback, which would normally apply to an MF district, would bump back to a 20, 20 foot. foot. That's correct. So is that potentially part of the applicant's motivation for going with MF1 or least intensive multifamily district as N opposed to? Not to my knowledge. Mm. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions on this item, commissioners? Okay, we'll keep going. Mr. Clinton's got the hot hand today with seven zoning cases. Make yourself comfortable there, sir. All right, this is case Z234-254. It's an application for an MF2 multifamily district on property zone CR Community Retail, located on the northwest side of East Grand Avenue between Casa Loma Avenue and Coronado Avenue. Uh, purpose of the request is to rezone the property to MF2 and to allow residential uses. It's approximately 17,000 square feet in size. Again, uh, currently zoned community retail and developed with an existing building and parking lot that was previously used as a self-serve car wash. Uh, this is a corner lot, so it has frontage on uh, Casa Loma and East Grand Avenues. Uh, geographically, it's in northeast Dallas, about five miles from downtown, um, just south of White Rock Lake. Uh, there has been one zoning case in the immediate area within the last five years, and this is a general zoning change. Here's our location map. This is our aerial map and zoning map showing the surrounding uses. So again, uh, the site is commercial retail to the north and to the west, uh, single family. So there's, it's R75A. Uh, to the east is PD808 with um, commercial retail. And then to the uh, south is MF2 with residential uses. Here we're on site looking northwest. This is on site looking southwest. This is on site looking northeast. This is on site looking southeast. Um, there's an existing uh, bus stop there. This is on East Grand Avenue looking Southwest, uh, same location looking northeast, uh, same location looking uh, southeast to the surrounding uses. Uh, this is looking southeast again uh, to the uh, multifamily. Here's our uh, development standards. So current uh, front yard setback will be 15 feet. Side and rear will be 20 feet um, adjacent to residential, and maximum height will be 54 feet uh, at four stories. Uh, the proposed is MF2A, so 15 foot front yard setback, um, but due to block face continuity, the adjacent uh, R75A lots would apply the 25 foot front yard setback um, to the site. Side and rear yard, uh, there will be uh, none imposed since the immediate adjacencies are single family. The max height will be 36 feet. And again, the use will be uh, uh, multifamily. So there are existing residential uses, um, again, single family as well as multifamily um, directly adjacent to the south of the site. Therefore, the request does fit within the existing uh, uses in the surrounding area. Um, and due to the max height allowed in the proposed zoning, a district, um, any future development would match the fabric, so there wouldn't be any issues with um, towering multifamily building in this uh, particular location. Staff's recommendation is approval. Thank you, sir. Questions? Commissioner Hampton. Um, Mr. Clinton, is it correct that with the residential adjacency that there'll be additional landscape buffer provisions required per Article 10? So I believe if it's residential to residential, there aren't a required uh, buffer. However, um, 
I think that the applicant is proposing to do that anyway, just to honor the existing uh, residential adjacencies. Um, I'll go back and reread Article 10 because I believe it is actually a requirement um, in the provision because of the different um, use between the MF2 and the um, residential. Um, second question was to do, um, is MIHDB planned for the site? Do you happen to know? Is that something discussed with the applicant? I, I believe it is not, but I think that's best suited for the applicant. Okay. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Commissioner Kingston. Are you aware that this site has been used um, for the last many years as either a dilapidated old car wash or temporary construction parking? I'm aware of the car wash, not the construction parking. Um, are you aware that the applicant has a history of doing gentle density in fill development in the area? Yes. Are you aware that the community has met with the applicant a couple of times and supports this? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Hall. <clears throat> One of my typical question, what kind of multifamily is planned? I believe the applicant has a presentation um, that he'll show later f during the public hearing. So that'll give more of an idea of what it'll look like and all the different uh, design standards and things like that. Would it be, uh, but just very quickly, apart apartments or? Uh, uh, multifamily apartments, I believe two story. Two story, yeah. thank you. Mm -hmm. Just as an FYI, this case is on consent, so we will not be hearing from the, the applicant unless anyone wants to pull it off. No? Okay. Any other questions on this item, commissioners? Okay, we'll stay with you, sir. We'll go to case number eight, uh, which has also come off consent um, for a, a couple of small little adjustments to the, the restrictions. All right, this is item number eight, case Z234-256, an application for an MU1 mixed use uh, district on property zone R75A, single family with existing SUP number 2250, located on the east side of North Masters Drive between Oak Gate Lane and Chicota uh, Drive. The purpose of the request is to rezone uh, to MU1 to allow a mix of commercial and residential uses. It's approximately 3.31 acres in total size. Um, this is currently developed with an existing building and parking lot previously used as a church. This lot has frontage on North Masters Drive. Geographically, it is in Southeast Dallas, about 13 miles from downtown. Um, again, purpose of the request is to rezone for mixed use development, uh, as well as volunteer deed restrictions. Um, applicant is volunteering deed restrictions that involve uh, prohibiting certain uses, providing buffers uh, through fencing and gating the proposed residential areas, as well as limits to the max height of the structures and limits to the number of dwelling units. The applicant is proposing a mixed use development of multifamily residential, so uh, about 16 townhomes, um, office space, and small retail uh, restaurant on the property. The existing SUP number 2250 is for a cell tower antenna communications and that will remain. Uh, the, again, the applicant is requesting a general zoning change and there have been zero cases in the immediate area within the last five years. Here's our location map. Here is our aerial map. And the zoning map showing the surrounding uses to the north, there are townhomes as well as single family. Um, again, the site is uh, R75A with existing SUP 2250. To the south and the west is also single family. Um, basically, the site is surrounded by R75A, um, but to the immediate west is the um, Young Men's Leadership Academy. Here are site visit photos. This is on site looking towards the um, existing building, uh, so east. This is on site looking Northeast, again on site looking north. This is on site looking east, on site looking south, again looking south, 
to the back of the site looking east uh, towards uh, some of the surrounding uses. On site looking north. Um, here we have images of the more uh, close up of the surrounding uses. Uh, this is looking south of the site. This is looking southwest towards the Leadership Academy. This is looking northwest. Here we're on uh, Masters Drive looking north. Um, quick development standards. So again, the existing is R75A, 25 foot front yard setback, five foot side and rear, um, 30 foot max height. The proposed is MU1, so 15 foot front yard setback, uh, 20 foot adjacent to uh, residential uses. So side and rear yard would be uh, 20 foot, 20 feet. Um, max height would be 90, 90 feet at seven stories or 120 feet at nine stories uh, with retail. However, again, the uh, applicant is uh, volunteering D restrictions to limit the height. Uh, brief staff analysis. So there are existing surrounding residential uses, single family uh, directly adjacent in all directions of the site. Uh, the request would fit within the existing uses of the surrounding area. Um, with the immediate area, uh, not so much, but due to the D restrictions, uh, they will assist with helping this proposal fit within the immediate area. Um, again, the applicant, um, sorry, no D restrictions for uh, volunteer for setbacks. Uh, block face continuity will be imposed. So existing R75A, again, that 25 foot uh, front yard setback would be um, imposed and then RPS does come into effect with the proposed building heights uh, limiting the max height of the proposed building. So you kind of have a double layering of uh, RPS as well as volunteer D restrictions to the max height that would limit um, the total height of the building. So again, if there's any concerns with a towering, you know, multifamily building or towering anything um, in this immediate area, that wouldn't be um, an issue. So staff's recommendation is approval subject to D restrictions volunteered by the applicant. And I do realize that there were some talks about or some changes to the D restrictions. So. Yes. Uh, I'll start the questions, commissioners. Uh, Mr. Clinton, are, are you aware that there was a second community meeting on Tuesday night? Yes. And uh, were you aware that uh, one of the neighbors that in, in the first community meeting was probably the most unhappy is now supporting the, the project? I was not, that's good news. Yes, it is. Uh, Commissioner Housrack. I think you just took care of my question. I was asked about community meetings. So yes, there, there were two community meetings, one on Tuesday night. And uh, were you aware that the, there's an additional deed restriction that Ms. Buckley is gonna introduce here this afternoon? Yes. Thank you, sir. Commissioner Carpenter. Um, not having attended any of the community meetings, I don't know what exactly was presented, so what they're supporting, but I, I see a possible disconnect between possibly what was presented and what the um, zoning and the combination of deed restrictions could uh, result in. For one, I mean, I understand I mean, the uses, after going through the list of uses that are prohibited, what I see remains as, as crops, child care, church, office, duplex, multifamily, restaurant without drive through, general merchandise less than 3,500 square feet, transit shelter, police, fire station, and cell tower. And it says here the maximum number of dwelling units is 16, but it doesn't specify that they're townhomes. I mean, reading this, you could end up with a 16 unit apartment complex and the rest of the acreage could have a church, an office, a restaurant. I mean, there could be a, consider, a considerable amount of non-residential. So I don't know if the intention was to limit the amount of non-residential or to try to limit the residential to townhome style. And my other question would have to do with the um, requirement that the residential areas be fenced and gated and the fence should be a minimum of six feet in height, but there's no um, description about what type of fence that could be. I don't think people want a chain link fence or anything like that. So was there any discussion about enhancing these these deed restrictions? Yes, I believe so. Um, and again, I think the applicant can speak more to that, but to my knowledge, um, the applicant is going to volunteer a certain type of fencing. I believe it's board fencing, um, but don't quote me on that. I, I would direct that question to, to the applicant. Uh, Commissioner Carpenter, is that the list that you got from the docket? Okay, that's a very old list of deed restrictions. You should have received that. Like, 
a couple of uh, one that I emailed Yolanda, so I'll, I'll send it to you. But yeah, that the one in the docket is gosh, it's almost ancient history now. Okay. Yeah, you, there's a refresh one that all of you should have received uh, yesterday. But I'll do you have any idea what time it was sent? I can look. Well, I don't. I, I, don't, I know what time I sent it, but I, okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you. I will. Yes. Get, I will look for it. Commissioner Hampton, please. The revised list may answer some of my questions. I will say I have a similar case in District Two. Um, but was there any discussion with the applicant about um, addressing the public realm, transparency requirements, things that we typically see? Um, and again, I can, I'll can i check the other deed restrictions, but similar to the last case, is it correct that the MU1 will have increased buffer standards um, related to the adjacent um, residential zoning? Yes, that's correct. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Uh, and uh, just Mr. Clinton, are you aware that the church is staying? Yes, that's good yes. news too. The church is staying. Thank you, sir. Commissioner Hall. So there's a, a currently an active church on site right now? Yes, I believe it is active. Uh, how long has it been, been there, do you know, roughly? Oh, I believe about 20 years, could be more. Um, I would have to double check uh, records, but it's been there for quite some time. Are you aware of any uh, prior use? Was um, was this housing in the past, or has it always been this uh, a church site? I'm not sure if there was existing housing before, um, but I can find that out. Uh, not, it's not a big deal. I'm just sort of curious about the history of the site, but. And finally, would these deed restrictions be uh, public, enforceable by the city? Yes. Uh, not private, but uh, enforceable by the city. That's correct. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, Mr. Clinton, are you, are you, Commissioner Wheeler has a question. Okay, I'm sorry, I can't see you, Commissioner. Please, Commissioner Wheeler. Um. It's, so this property, because I, I couldn't, you, you went through the, the site map so fast. Is this site actually on Masters? Yes, it is. So is there also, um, is there going to be a, um, so that is a MD travel thoroughfare. Is there going to, is there anything in, in it that has at least a six foot sidewalk? There has not been talks of that, but I believe the applicant does have a presentation um, as well as some other um, images and graphics to show today. So that might come up during the public hearing. Is there any reason why that recommendation wasn't put in place um, after looking at the thoroughfare and seeing that it's highly walkable, but it also is missing sidewalks, that uh, safety sidewalks that would allow for um, the children walking back and forth in school. That's a great question. And there is currently existing, um, I believe, four foot sidewalk when I was out there um, doing my site visit. Um, however, this again, this is just a general zoning change. So anything regarding design standards, um, how things are going to be laid out or how they're going to look, that would be more geared towards the applicant. Um, and Again, for a general zoning change case, we typically don't focus on those specific things. Okay. Probably one of the reasons I'm pushing for design standards and me and residential. Okay. Commissioner Blair. Mr. Clinton, is it not correct that even though there's four foot sidewalks wouldn't the, the development of sidewalks have to be ADA compliant? Yes, and the ADA compliant requirement is minimum six feet. Any other questions, commissioners? Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Clinton. Uh, takes it to case number nine that has also come off consent.
Good morning. Good morning. Are you able to see my screen? We can. Great. Uh, this is case number Z234265. It is a new SUP for 1930 Pacific Avenue. So it's a new SUP for a bar, lounge, or tavern, and commercial amusement indoor limited to a dance hall. The request is for a three year time period. It's loca uh, located on the southeast corner of Harwood and Pacific in downtown, and it's located in uh, Council District 14. Here's the location map and the aerial, as well as the uh, surrounding uses and zoning. Uh, so a little background, the building uh, is located within PD 619 and the previous SUP 2050 was established in 2020 and it expired. Here are some site uh, photos, apologies for the grainy quality. Um, here's the, the front entrance to uh, the nightclub uh, here is on Pacific looking west uh, and on Harwood looking north. Here's the site plan as you, uh, and an enlarged uh, version of the site plan. As you can see in the middle, there is a 900 square foot uh, dance floor. And staff's recommendation is approval for a three year period subject to site plan and conditions. Thank you, sir. Questions, commissioners? Commissioner King. So this operations SUP expired in April of 2023, is that correct? Yes. And they didn't apply for a new one until June of 2024? Uh, that, is, uh, that is correct. And they've been operating continuously without an SUP since April of 2023? Um, I believe so, yes. And still, they're operating today, right? Yes. And you listed the requirements to grant a specific use permit found in 51A, dash 4.219 in the case report and you found that all of those requirements had been met right uh, i did yes what's your rationale for that um so my uh my rationale was that um uh, this does um complement the the existing uh character of the area the entertainment uses uh it is yes it is um currently operating without an SUP um, and uh, that I do believe should have been uh, taken into more consideration um, but that was my that was my rationale for um, approval so a couple of the factors that go into whether an SUP should be granted is that contributes to enhances or promotes the welfare of the area of request in, in adjacent properties and is not detrimental to the public health, safety, or general welfare. Did you do any research about this operation before determining that it complies with those criteria? I did. Uh, for the land use criteria, I did believe that it complemented the, the surrounding uses. Um, I was made aware of the, um, the crime statistics recently, um, and um, that would have changed my uh, my uh, recommendation some, but uh, as for specifically for land use, I do believe that it complements the surrounding area based off of uh, the uses surrounding uh, within downtown. So you didn't obtain the crime statistics before you made your recommendation? I'll just add, I'm Go sorry. Ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. I, typically we don't request them for new SUPs. And this is a new SUP application. We do, we do have it now if anyone wants it, but we typically don't request them for new SUPs because we don't have an uh, application to associate it with. But you knew that this was an SUP that expired. It's, yeah, it's, it's a new S, but it's a new SUP nonetheless. So it's part of our typical procedures. When it's a new SUP, it's not necessarily necessary. Uh, we're not judging them based on the new SUP and we're not giving them credit as a renewal or anything like that at the same rate. So you do have the crime statistics now though, correct? Yes, I do. And with that information, would that change your recommendation? It's something that I would need to look into um, and speak with the applicant about more. I would just add in, yeah, no, crime statistics are not gonna affect 
our zoning and land use recommendation for an SUP. Okay. But that is something that we consider. Well, it's part of the legal standard, so it's uh, something that we, we should consider be frequently. At. In fact, correct. Is that correct? That is that is something I would consider. And and I did send around a packet. I know it was kind of late uh, because I didn't get the information from DPD until yesterday. But it it did hit all of your inboxes this morning. If you want to take a look at it, thank you for that. I was just asking about that, Commissioner Carpenter, from uh, Commissioner Houseright. Yes, I'm struggling with the idea that we that. Consideration of the legal standard for an SUP is not a component in making a recommendation for a land use case. Which legal standard are you talking about? The, the criteria yeah, listed. Yeah, the criteria that it you know not be that it contribute positively to the public welfare. I know I sent Mr. Kerr an email Friday night asking if he was aware with a no, of a notorious case that had been covered in the local paper about um, a rape that occurred in the restroom and a subsequent legal um, case brought against the uh, the operation for serving underage girls and tolerating you know all sorts of things and so I asked um, for there to be you know some consideration or some investigation into the crime statistics and the TABC record and all that and I didn't get a response and I, I didn't hear it addressed today so I, I'm just yeah I'm I'll just I'm taken aback by the fact that we're not um, applying the legal standard for consideration for an SUP and making these land use recommendations. So if you have any comment on that, I'd appreciate it. Yes, thank you for that. No, the, the code standard that we look at is the uh, 4.219, and that's, like you said, not detrimental to the public health, safety, and welfare conform in all other aspects. That is with the tools that we have in Chapter 51A, which is zoning and land use. And we do not take crime as a consideration in that. Commissioner House, right? Um, Mr. Pepe, is the owner and applicant on this case the same as the owner and applicant of the expired SUP? And if so, can we take that into consideration? No, so my understanding is a new owner and app applicant. And should we take it under consideration? I would say no. That's true. I just want to understand the level at, at which staff is, is analyzing this. That SUP center says that the city shall not grant an SUP for a use except upon a finding that the use will, and then there's the four factors, A through D. At what level is, is staff analyzing the use here? Are they analyzing this as the a hypothetical nightclub that could be there, that could be great, that could be terrible? Or are we looking at this nightclub that's been operating on the ground since some time? Or is staff, I should say, looking at this as the nightclub that, that, that um, you know, has been operating on the ground since time X in the past? I think, yeah, I think what you pointed out is a good way to look at it. Um, the, the use is a, the use is a commercial amusement indoor. We're looking at, is that use appropriate for the area? Are they meeting the requirements of zoning code, Chapter 51A, and is it appropriate in a use-to-use uh, -use adjacency sense? It's downtown, uh, they do meet the zoning code. If there are other standards that are violating, that can be an issue for them in the long run, but it's not part of zoning recommendation. But we as, we as commissioners, right, if we see a use that's operating pursuant to an SUP or for a request SUP and see real problems on the ground with that use, we can say, no, absolutely not. We're not going to allow this, you know, SUP. We're going to recommend denial of this SUP. Vice Chair Rubin, is this? Uh, the SUP runs with the land. It is a, a, to land use if whatever... Um, applicant goes out of business next week, the SUP will still be in existence until the expiration date and a subsequent purchaser can come in, comply with the same site plan requirements and use that SUP until it expires. So it really runs with the land. It is a land use, not a land user. If we've seen problematic examples of that use on this site in the past, that's something that we can factor into our 
decision on whether or not to recommend approval. The third you. factor is whether or not it's detrimental to public health safety in general, or sorry, public, whether or not it's detrimental to the public health safety or general welfare. If you think that the use is detrimental to public health safety or general welfare, then you can deny the SUP. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Herbert. Um, I think the, the, the point here or what needs to be clarified and maybe the applicant can come do that later, but um, is this a new owner? Um, from what I'm seeing it is um, in the, the new owner's reputation for running business is much different than the previous owner's representation, but I think um, will we have an opportunity to talk to the applicant today? Yes, the applicant is is present. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Hampton. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, follow up for Mr. Moore. Is it correct since what we're hearing is that staff is evaluating this based on the land use criteria within 51A, if the existing SUP expired, we are now functionally reviewing a new SUP that for all intents and purposes is a renewal. Doesn't that not demonstrate the operational standard? Well, not operational standards, the land use standards for this site. Is that not a consideration for this body? They clearly weren't able to comply with the land use standards. Commissioner, the, I guess the way I would say you can think about it is ultimately it is the land use, not the land user. And if you've seen that this use is not compatible in that adjacent or in that area for whatever reason, and you think that one of the four factors that CPC and council are tasked with making it, you're making your recommendation based on if you, you can approve or deny based on those factors. Does that help you out? I think so. And I think we've had enough conversation on the consideration of health, safety, and welfare. So I won't follow up there. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Moore. Uh, can Back I add there, something? Please. I'm sorry. So I would say it to make it easier, the difference between a new SUP and an SUP renewal. For the new SUP, the question goes back to, is this a good use of land at this location? For a renewal is, is this still a good use at this location? That's it. Not the operator. Do we need to add operational conditions to make it a good use of land? That's fine. I would still, again, it's a new SUP. Do we, do we think this is a good use of land at this location at this point, starting now? That's the only question that we have now. Yeah. So if you are running a bad operation, the way to reset the clock is to let your SUP expire and then come back in and act as if you're an innocent operator? Uh, I'm sorry, but as I said, like SUPs, this is a land use, as Daniel was saying. This is, we're not being punitive. We're not using the SUP to get applicants out of business or not. The question is land use. Is this is a, night of, a commercial amusement indoor that can be a lot of things, a good use of land at this location? And we can make a land use rationale, deny or approve. But it's not, nobody's tricking anybody. We don't, again, operate on the presumption that we let it slide or not. Make, please do make a land use recommendation based on this particular land use. That is a new SUP right now. And if I can add to that, Commissioner, you can consider how this land use, oh, sorry, is that better? Oh, okay. And if I can add to that, Commissioner, you can consider how the land use has impacted the adjacent properties. You just can't consider how that specific user's use has impacted the adjacent properties. Thank you. Commissioner Hall. Uh, this is from Mr. Moore. Uh, well, so what, ha say theoretically, one were to deny this request, that would not shut down operations, would it? Assuming CPC were to recommend denial and that either decision was appealed to council and council recommend or council approved that denial or it was not appealed to CPC, the use would not be allowed and it would become an issue for code to uh, go in and stop the illegal land use at that point. Thank you. Commissioner Kingston. 
How are they operating now without an SUP? Because I understood that if an applicant applied for a renewal before their SUP expired, it was city policy to allow them to continue to operate as long as their application was pending until <clears throat> this body and or council made a decision. But if they allowed it to lapse, that they had to shut down until they could apply and get a decision. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah. So the first statement is, is certainly true that generally they get, you, you know, any situation in which there's a non-conforming, not uh, permitted land use, um, it's pretty standard for code to give them breaks uh, as they operate, but not necessarily a, a hard and fast rule. Uh, on the other hand, if they have a non-existing SUP, I don't think that I would I wouldn't necessarily say that the same applies, but that is in the, under the bounds of code enforcement. So, if we have young women being raped in the restroom and children being shot as bystanders, we're going to allow that operation to operate without a valid SUP in the city in downtown. That's that's the standard. I, well, I just want to understand. The, I, I would let, let the attorney answer that. Again, in front of us right now, we're not talking about the crime or allowing crime to happen at the property. The question in front of us is a commercial amusement inside, a new SUP for a new commercial amusement inside a good use of land at this location. The crime aspect of it, we have DPD, we have code compliance to deal with that. We can put 311 complaints, we can call 911. We have that, that has its own path and recourse for us, it's we're a city plan commission. We're talking about this land use at this location. Commissioner Blair. So, if you're looking at is this use good for the surrounding community, we can we could look at this and say that this that this particular site may not be good for this surrounding community correct sure and make an land use rationale absolutely so okay thank you thank you commissioner hampton no any other questions commissioner herbert please sir is there any way to to um find out even before the hearing if this is a new owner, new applicant, um, and that this SUP was issued to a different applicant. Is there any way to confirm that before the hearing? Before the hearing, they can they can answer that in terms of who's the applicant and who's the owner. And but, how long they've been known. Okay, thank you. But at the end of the day, we're still approving the use, not the user. Gotcha. Commissioner Hall. Just to, <clears throat> just to follow up on Commissioner Blair's comment, I'm not an attorney, but the way I would look at that, land use and, oper and operations are two different things. So you might could function Hall. there as a nightclub and be a great neighbor. Commissioner Hall, it's That's, still a briefing, so yeah, I would we'll go we'll let those questions, questions, questions for discussion. All right. we'll keep I'm, I'm aware of that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, never mind. I'll follow up later. I'm sure there'll be lots of discussion on this case this afternoon. Any other questions for staff on this item, commissioners? It's off consent. It is off consent. <laughs> oh, yes. It has been flaming off consent. Uh, let's take a 10 minute break, commissioners. It's 10.32 a.m. We are recording. It is 10.42. Commissioners, we're going to head back into the record, go into the uh, well, before we get to the zoning cases, we take a quick step back to case number three in District 5 is going to be held under advisement to October 10th. Uh, and so I think that takes care of all the cases. And we are in order. Case number 10, I believe that has not been briefed before. And um, let's table that for the moment. Let, Commissioner Blair, uh, get back in the ring on that one. So, we'll... oh, she is here. Okay. Which one did you want to hear again? No, number 10. 10. Yes, sir. 
I think it has not been briefed before. Is that right? It's been briefed. So let's do uh, any updates, if there are any. I need to remind myself which one number 10 is. Oh, let me, one moment. Yeah, no, I'm told there are no official updates for, for 10. Okay, commissioner's questions on uh, case number 10, Z223302. Any questions on this item? Okay, we'll go to number 11. Has this one been briefed? No, let's brief this one today then. <laughs> Yes, this is case number Z234134. It's a general zoning change for uh, 1030 and 1032 Commerce Street, West Commerce Street. Uh, so this is a zoning change request from an IR to a TH3 townhome district. Uh, the purpose is to, uh, if the request is to permit residential uh, uses on the property, and it's located at 1030 and 1032 West Commerce Street. Here is the location. And here is an aerial property. It is currently um, vacant. Um, surrounding uses, there is an IR uh, to the west um, and to the north. And then to the south, there uh, is a currently vacant but planned multifamily development. And uh, to the southwest, there is uh, it's PD 935 for uh, with a, a TH1A. So background, this is an industrial research uh, zoning site. site is currently vacant with a visible, uh, visible building slab. Um, surrounding properties have been, uh, to the south, have been uh, rezoned to similar uses. So here is uh, on Commerce Street looking south. So you can see there is the, uh, the Oak Cliff behind. Um, I was not able to access the site, so um, just have some, um, this is on Commerce Street looking east. And then um, once again on Commerce Street, looking south towards the south, you can see the townhomes to the top. Uh, apologies for the um, for it saying Bernal up at the top. Uh, for the development standards, so uh, front uh, the proposed setbacks would be would be zero or um, ten for, and the side and rear would be ten feet for non single family uses. A lot coverage is sixty percent. Um, density is no more than twelve units per acre. 2,000 foot minimum lot size, and then uh, 30 foot feet maximum height. Comprehensive plan um, compliance. So uh, this does align with goals 1.1 and 1.3 for the land use element, uh, as well as 2.5 um, for the economic element, as well as uh, goals 4.3, 5.1, and 5.2 for the neighborhood plus to expand, uh, specifically to expand home ownership within the city and staff's recommendation is approval of this. Questions, commissioners? Any questions on this item? Okay, thank you, sir. We'll go to number 12. Okay, let's table number 12 for just a moment. We'll go to number 13. Number 13, uh, going to be heard today, Commissioner, no? Okay, hold to November 7th, number 13, so we'll go to number 14. Back to you, Mr. Clint, sir.
This is item number 14, case Z234-224, an application for one, an amendment to track two within plan development district number 234, and two, a specific use permit for a service station on the east side of South Cockrell Hill Road, south of Cor Corral Drive. Uh, proposal is for a new SUP for the property to provide service stations with fuel pumps. It's about one acre in total size. Um, again, currently zone uh, PD number 234, subdistrict track two, uh, currently undeveloped vacant lot. This lot has frontage on South Cockrell Hill Road. Um, again, the purpose of, of the request is to um, propose a service station with fuel pumps operating 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Uh, there have been one case in the last five years within the immediate area. Um, this case was held under advisement from the August 8th hearing. Um, there have been no changes since that case, since that hearing. Here's our location map. This is the aerial map. Our zoning map here showing the surrounding uses. Um, again, the site is PD 234, subdistrict track two. To the north, we have R10A, single family, um, as well as, uh, Oh, and to the immediate north um, is also PD 234, subdistrict tract one. To the um, east of the site is uh, MF1A, multifamily with D restrictions, uh, Z856 197. To the south and east of the site are MF1 uh, residential. Here we have the site visit photos. This is on uh, South Cockrell Hill Road, looking north. This is on the same, uh, at the same location looking east. Same location looking north again. Um, same location looking east. This is on site looking west. This is on site looking south. Again, on site looking south. Uh, surrounding uses photos. This is uh, on on property looking uh, directly west. This is on property looking north. Uh, on property looking south, and then uh, on property looking east towards the uh, multifamily. Uh, this is the proposed site plan. Uh, staff analysis, so the uh, the site is a bit sloped, so the design will have to address this and mitigate any erosion or runoff that would possibly occur so that that doesn't uh, bleed over to the ex existing family dollar uh, commercial uh, site. There is a multifamily residential to the east and the south of the site, so there would be buffers required. Um, and staff is uh, not in support of the request due to the proposed use uh, uh, staff finding the, the proposed use to be inappropriate next to the existing residential uses, incompatible with the immediate area and uh, the potential harmful impacts to the immediate uh, adjacent uses and unsuitability of the site. Staff recommendation is denial. Questions, commissioners? Commissioner Herbert. Um, yes, was there uh, any conversation or in your review, were there any other um, gas stations or uses like this around the area? Um, upon my site visit, I did see um, other uh, similar uses in the immediate area, maybe. Uh, okay. um, looking at this uh, PD and this, this track of it, can you kind of describe what else could go in this area besides a gas station? I thought there was a list in the case report, but I could have been reading another one. Um, yes, yeah, so uh, there within this uh, specific track, uh, residential uses could go there, commercial uses could go there. Um, I don't have off the top of my head the specific, okay. you know, under those two categories, but definitely residential and commercial. Okay, and, and the basis of your denial is the multifamily next door to the um, uh, 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 west side, I believe, of this, this location, correct? That's correct. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Chernock. Was there any neighborhood opposition? Not to my knowledge. Oh, and I have one more question. In the, in the staff report, you had listed three things for harf, harmful impacts to surrounding uses. 
And then unsuitability of the site. Can you, can you tell me a little bit about the unsuitability of the site for you? Uh, so the unsuitability of the site, I did uh, briefly touch on that. With the, um, slight, the site being slightly sloped, um, the design would have to address that so that way um, any erosion or runoff would not bleed over into the existing site. So it's also currently on a hill um, so they would have to regrade the site, do a bunch of different design um, elements so that way it does not run off into the um, existing family dollar site as, and also the parking lot that's there. But I mean, uh, site conditions like that are typical. I mean, there always needs to be, often there needs to be a reworking of the site to get proper drainage, et cetera. Why would that be a, con why would that be a condition that you would recommend a denial? That's a good question. So I think uh, that was a condition for denial. That wasn't the main uh, reason for denial, but that is one of the things that we considered within the um, analysis. Uh, Commissioner Hall, then I'll follow you, sir. So when you say potential harmful effects, uh, uh, as a factor to deny this request, but but you also say that commercial, some type of commercial could go in there. What what are potential harmful effects? Is it the 24-hour operation? Is it uh, fuel, fumes from the fuel? Is it the danger of fire? I mean, what, what are they? Everything you just stated, actually. Okay. Those, those are the potential right. harmful effects. Just the nature of a... 24-hour fuel center. Exactly, and right by the existing residential uses, yeah. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Quick follow-up for you. Um, so in, in terms of the site, uh, you know, at, a, at, a, at an acre, it's, it's not small, it's not large, but the way that the orientation it's, uh, you know, the, the, the length of the piece is uh, per perpendicular to Cocker Hill instead of parallel. Would that have made a difference in, in, in terms of the, the acre is really further into uh, some of the, the adjacency versus if, if it's the acre would have been entirely on Cocker Hill might have made a difference? Potentially, um, but we didn't look Staff didn't look at that directly because, again, it's the request is just the SUP to allow the um, the 24-hour uh, fuel pumps. Perfect. Um, any other questions on this item, commissioners? Thank you, sir. And commissioners, just just for the record, we uh, sometimes when we were a little fast and we we skip a beat, we did brief number 11. Is that correct? Mr. Kerr, you, you brief number 11 when we came back for break after we did 10 and then 11, or did we skip 11? Uh, 11. We did 11. Yeah, we did 11. We skipped 10, which has been briefed before. Yes. Um, I think we were going to circle back to item 12 because it's a D7 case. Yes. Uh, I heard that item 13 is going to be held under advisement to November 7th. Okay. Uh, and while we're talking about item 13, um, if uh, we're thinking about considering a PD um, at the next hearing, uh, in the motion we'll need uh, instructions to staff to re-advertise for a PD or, um, you know, whatever, what other option we're going with so we can re-notice it. Um, and then we just did 14. Okay. What case were you just describing? The, the one on 10? One. Oh, the, the one number 13, 13 in District 10. Yes. Okay, so just to, for the record, are there any questions on number 11? Commissioner Carpenter? Yes, Mr. Kerr, is he there? Mr. Kerr, are you online, sir? That's okay. It can wait till the hearing. Yes. Then um, let's go to number 15.
All right, this is item number 15, case Z234-110, an application for a, uh, one, a new plan development district for an R one acre single family district uses and two, the termination of specific use permit number 580 for a private school with consideration for a specific use permit for a private school on property zone in R1A, one acre uh, single family district. The purpose of the request is to allow modified uh, development standards uh, related to uses, setbacks, floor area height, lot coverage, parking, and fencing uh, to allow a private school, and it's approximately three acres in total size. Uh, geographically located in northern Dallas, again, it's currently zoned R1 acre uh, with the existing SUP 580. This lot has frontage on West and Northwest Highway. Um, the applicant proposes the creation of a new plan development to allow private school use and removal of the existing um, SUP 580. Uh, the existing SUP um, has been in effect since 1989 and revised uh, a few times over the last uh, 30 years. Uh, there is an existing private school on the property um, and that, <clears throat> excuse me, that uh, section is highlighted in orange in the uh, future slides. The applicant has uh, acquired the property to the east, which is highlighted in red. Um, again, we'll show that on the future slides. And uh, they have the intention to develop the new site uh, further turning the school into a campus. Um, the existing school is currently pre-K to second grade, uh, and they have plans to expand to eighth grade in the future. There has been a traffic management plan completed as of February of this year, uh, with updates to be scheduled every two years. The site also has an existing creek directly behind it, uh, so the applicant has uh, made strides to um, do conservation and preservation methods, uh, as well as designed to maintain the creek and the existing trees. The new school is set to be two stories and under 36 feet in total height. Um, property to the east of the site, uh, which is highlighted in red, is currently undeveloped. And the applicant will be providing sufficient buffer and screening along the residential sides of the property. Um, additionally, they want the applicant wants an eight foot fence along the front entrance of the property. Um, they currently have a Dallas PD officer on duty during the officer hours of operation, and they intend to um, uh, implement that with the new school. Additionally, the applicant wants the school to be allowed by right and not with the use of an SUP. Um, so their justification for requiring a PD includes deviations to parking, location, space count, um, wanting the eight foot fence in, along the front uh, entrance of the property, and location of an accessory use. Here's our location map. This is the aerial map, and again, just highlighting the existing site, which is in orange, and the um, proposed site, which will be combined, which is in the red. Here's our zoning map, uh, showing the surrounding uses. To the immediate west of the site is R1 acre, single family. To the south and east of the site is R16, single family. To the north of the site is PD815, and that is uh, currently developed as Lover's, Lover's Lane United Methodist Church. And then there's also a uh, single family um, R1 acre to the north um, next to the, the church. Here we have site visit photos. This is on site looking south. This is also on site looking south. This is on site looking east. This is on the, um, the, the new site, which is outlined in red, looking south. This is on the proposed site, looking southwest. This is at the back of that proposed site, looking south towards the creek, the existing creek. This is on the proposed site, looking east. On the proposed site looking north, this is back on the existing site looking north, back on the existing existing site looking west, uh, same location looking south, same location looking southwest, 
and uh, to the back of the existing property looking south. And the last one looking southeast. <laughs> Uh, so the applicants request uh, for a PD, their justifications include uh, relief from front yard setback from 40 feet, the required 40 feet to 20 feet uh, to accommodate the school building as well as any playgrounds, uh, sports courts, as well as the allowance of encroachments within that front yard setback. The second justification is to reduce the um, the rear and side yard setbacks from 20 feet to 10 feet, as well as allowing encroachments within that, those side and rear yard setbacks. The next one is to uh, provide parking within the front yard setback. And finally, the, uh, the last justification is an eight foot fence, uh, wanting an eight foot fence and security gate within the front yard setback. Here is the applicant's proposed development plan. And slightly enlarged uh, staff is, uh, sorry, I'll get into that in the later slide. So here we have the development standards. Um, the current existing base is R1 acre. So the front yard setback is 40 feet and um, side in rear yard would be 10 feet. Uh, due to the immediate single family adjacencies. Uh, the max height would be 36 feet. The new uh, or the proposed would be um, remaining within the R1 acre, um, but doing a planned development. Uh, the front yard setback, again, the request is to do 20 feet uh, with encroachments. Uh, so the encroachments include a sports court um, and playgrounds and sports courts may encroach within the front yard. Um, and then the maximum eight foot fence uh, would be allowed in the front yard. Um, again, as a part of their PD justification. Um, proposed side and rear yard will be 10 feet with encroachments and the max height will be 36 feet. I do want to point out, though, that uh, block face continuity would be imposed on the subject site, requiring a front yard setback of 40 feet due to the residential adjacencies uh, immediately west of the site. Uh, so staff's recommendation is actually um, an SUP. And the purpose of a plan development district is to provide flexibility within planning um, as well as uh, development projects to allow a combination of land uses uh, under a uniform plan that protects contiguous land uses and preserves significant natural features. Uh, these are deemed appropriate if and when uh, the implementation of the existing code cannot accommodate a use or development within the bounds of a conventional zoning district um, where there might be unique site characteristics um, present to that necessitate relief or modification from uh, base code provisions. And when considering these uh, alterations requested by uh, through the base zoning, um, only minor adjustments to a site plan would be necessary um, it could be codified under SUP conditions, um, including the exemption to the proposed parking, accessory use, and setbacks. So staff uh, does not find the uh, PD justification to be substantial. Um, therefore, staff is recommending an SUP with an initial approval period of 10 years uh, with no eligibility for automatic renewal. And to operate under the SUP, there would only be uh, minor adjustments to the design and uh, to the site plan necessary. So one of the uh, adjustments would be shifting the front building facade uh, back by five feet to accommodate the uh, 40 foot front yard setback, uh, removing that parking from the front yard um, setback, which could be um, 
which could be addressed through SUP conditions as well as um, a combination of um, off street parking and on site parking. So here is staff's recommended site plan. And this is the enlarged version. So the dash line here is the uh, 40 foot front yard setback. So staff is uh, requesting that the applicant redesign the site to remove this uh, first row of parking out of the front yard setback. And again, that could be done through a combination of on-site and off-site parking and written into SUP conditions. Um, move the gate back from out of the front yard setback to align with the building um, to accommodate U-turns um, because currently it, that presents a safety concern. Um, when we went out to do our site visit, um, there is not a lot of room to make a U-turn or uh, queue up in the area, if you will. And then with the proposal of the fence being directly in the front yard, that could potentially cause traffic issues. Um, and the, I guess the last thing was the accessory, uh, the accessory use of the sports court here. However, uh, the applicant has uh, reoriented the sports court so that any vertical structures are uh, beyond the 40 foot front yard setback. Therefore, that would be an allowed uh, use. Sorry, just going through my notes here. All right. Um, so again, applicant's justification for a PD, um, staff found that, that the request is not significant from a land use or zoning standpoint. Um, their justification for deviating from the development code um, is insufficient. Additionally, the deviations requested can be addressed by using other methods um, to be in closer compliance with our development code. One of the methods is through a combination a general zoning change in conjunction with a um, permanent SUP. However, staff is recommending uh, the method of just a specific use permit with a limited time period. Um, again, uh, another thing to consider, the existing residential adjacencies, uh, block face continuity, uh, traffic and parking could be a major issue. Again, this is a very busy and act highly active highway. Um, when I was there for my site visit, you know, speed limit is 50, but that means 70. So um, we don't want to potentially cause any any further traffic uh, issues or backup. Uh, therefore, staff is recommending that the fence be pushed back to allow for proper queuing. Um, we do also have our traffic and engineering um, expert here that can speak more to that. Uh, there's Article 10 compliances that uh, requires buffers on certain portions of the site um, that are directly adjacent to the residential uses. So they, uh, the applicant would be required to provide uh, re uh, buffers on the west, south, and east portions of the site. However, due to the existing creek that takes up a good portion of the west and south of the site, they, uh, the applicant will use that to count towards their residential buffer. Um, however, they will be required to plant uh, new trees for residential buffer zone to um, the east portion of the site. And I'll get more into that um, in a future slide. Actually, the next slide. <laughs> So residential buffer zone, I'm sorry, let me get my notes, um, is uh, the requirements is that uh, it must has, have an average depth of 10 feet, um, a minimum depth of five feet, and a maximum depth of 30 feet. Uh, no portion of the residential buffer zone may exceed 10% of the lot depth, um, excluding paved services at points of vehicular or and pedestrian ingress, ingress or egress. Um, another requirement within the residential buffer zone is that uh, large trees, large or medium trees, uh, must be planted. However, due to the uh, I guess the site constraints and the way that the design has been laid out, um, they will not be able to plant those large or medium trees. Therefore, they would have to do two small trees in lieu of the 
large or medium tree for that eastern side of the, the property. And I can go back to the, the plan here. So this portion of the site here, they are proposing a retaining wall, which cuts into that necessary or that required uh, maximum depth and width to plant a large or medium tree. So again, they would be um, doing a two small tree in lieu of the one large or medium tree. Additionally, there, uh, there is a street buffer zone requirement. I'll go back to the plan here. So along this frontage here, um, the applicant will be required to do a street buffer zone. And again, the, same, the requirements um, for the residential buffer zone apply as well. So they will be required to do one large or medium tree uh, per 40 feet along this entire frontage here. However, due to site constraints, there are under, underground utilities, water lines, as well as overhead utilities that um, limit, limit what they can do for the uh, street buffer zone. So again, they would do the two small trees in lieu of the one large or medium tree. Um, staff is also requiring um, through the recommendation of an SUP that the applicant uh, go above and beyond and plant, um, plant this area up. So basically do an enhanced street buffer zone um, and create a cascading or layering of planting along this frontage here. So they would have the small trees to the back portion of the, the buffer zone um, and then go down to uh, medium shrubs and then go down to perennials and uh, ground cover. And then lastly, Article 10 checklist. Um, there are certain number of points that the site has, has to meet. Um, this site has to meet uh, 30 points. Uh, as a part of the requirement and I have given the applicant that list so that they can look through that and make their pick of what options they want to choose to meet those 30 points. Um, but I am recommending option two, which is the enhanced design, which is basically what I just explained with the street buffer zone, as well as uh, I believe it's option 11. And all of that is uh, laid out and detailed in the case report. So lastly, um, adjustments to the traffic management plan. Again, um, as it sits with the current development plan, the way that it is designed would potentially cause traffic issues. Um, so traffic backup, um, no room for uh, queuing of uh, pickup and drop off, Again, uh, West Northwest Highway is very active, very busy. So uh, we would, uh, I guess, recommend that they do some adjustments to that plan. And again, um, our expert is here and he can speak more to that if you have questions regarding that. Uh, lastly, off street parking screening. Um, so all off street parking must be screened from adjacent street frontage. Um, and staff is requiring that the applicant place an advanced screening design to layer in additional shrubs and ground cover for that off street uh, parking screening requirement. Um, and then the final thing, uh, their required parking again, um, they are proposing, I believe it's 21 classrooms. And so the uh, requirement for their parking would be 44 parking spaces. I'm sorry, so the applicant is proposing 14 elementary classrooms, six middle school classrooms. Um, and so this amount would typically require 42 parking spaces, um, but staff is recommending removing parking from the front yard, which is prohibited in the existing residential zoning district. Um, and the applicant may either reorganize the spaces within the design, within the site, so doing a better uh, in a different design to find the balance. Um, or adjust the requirement through uh, the zoning case. So both the SUP or the plan development district can adjust the required parking um, to the total uh, spaces that are required for the, the school on site. So finally, staff's recommendation is approval of a specific use permit for a private school for a 10 year period subject to staff's recommended conditions and a revised site plan in lieu of a plan development district. Thank you, sir. Commissioner Houseright.
Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Clinton, you, you mentioned the 42 required spaces. Um, I count 38 on the plan. You said there's 44, so maybe I'm not looking at the right plan. So there was a new development plan sent out um, after the published docket. Um, I'm not sure if you all received that. However, again, yes, the requirement would be uh, 42, and they can meet that by having on-site parking within their, their parking lot um, directly next to their building, as well as doing um, off-street uh, parking. So having an, an agreement with, um, and I believe there was talks of that, of having an agreement with the uh, property to the west. Did you count the sneaky parking spots parallel along the building? There should be six that are pa parallel along the building. Commissioner Blair. Can you bring up page 35 where you have the, where you, the setback? The, yeah, that one. Um, I count 14 spaces. Park, are those, is that correct? Yes. So in your recommendation, that they would lose those 14 spaces and it appears that they are challenged for parking at this point in time um, and that and one of the other things that you said was the TMP may need some adjustments um, if they okay so let me ask a question and, and this is and, and I guess and this is not really my minds to to ask but I'm asking it anyway uh, um, in the the design that is on this page with the recommendation to push this back would that not challenge the whole presentation of this particular site so it would provide some challenges, but those challenges could absolutely be met through design changes. So reworking the design of the site to make sure that they are meeting the requirements for the parking. I actually took a stab at that myself and was able to push, not only push the parking beyond the 40 foot front back, but also get them well within about 36 spaces. So then they would just have to meet the other, what, eight spaces through um, a parking agreement or um, off-street parking. But if this is residential, if it's surrounding residential, would we really want um, them to use residential uh, streets in order to park for this particular site? No, but it's a good thing that the property to the west has a extensive parking lot. And again, I think I mentioned that um, there has been talks um, by the applicant in that neighboring property that there would be a some sort of shared agreement that they could use some of their parking um, as overflow or things like that. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Carpenter. Uh, before we move on, I also want to add that um, uh, whether it's a PD or an SUP, um, this is a use where the parking requirement can be set by the SUP. Um, so the parking requirement could always be adjusted um, with that option. So, Kent, may I? So, um, Mr. Mulkey, so when you're saying that, if you're saying that you're, the recommendation is an SUP and the parking could be set by the SUP, with, are you saying that you would make a suggestion or recommendation to lower the number of parking spaces? We're pretty much always in favor of lowering code standard parking requirements, uh, and this use would be no exception to that. But if you do that, and there is already a challenge with how um, they manage their, tra their, their, their traffic, and you, and you reduce the number of required parking spaces, would that not add to the challenge of the TMP? Yeah, so um, as Laquan suggested, uh, staff's recommendation on this would um, kind of point in the direction 
of a redesign of the site. Uh, and that really gets more into staff's policy for schools, uh, whether it is the uh, great work that Jennifer Allgaier has done with the DISD schools, the public schools, um, or applying those same policies and standards to private schools, charter schools, et cetera. Um, the, the trend that we see uh, with all schools is that the design work is done up front, um, the site is laid out, you know, however that particular um, applicant wants to lay out the site. Uh, and then zoning is what comes after that. And the zoning is tailored to the design that has already been decided upon. Um, what staff's policy is, is that the design of the site um, start with what the zoning is, what the current requirements of the existing zoning district are, uh, and then the design is to fit within those zoning requirements. So that's that's really what staff is is advocating for here. You know, bigger picture, um, and it would lead to a redesign of the site that would, of course, need to address, you know, building placement, parking requirements, traffic flow, all that kind of stuff. Commissioner Carpenter. Yeah. My question is why this case is to us right now for approval with some what sounds like some very significant um, issues unresolved. Um, we don't have a site design that has been agreed to. We don't. We have an unresolved parking situation. Yes, the report says that the parking requirement can be addressed through the SGP or the PD, but but we don't have that. We don't have any adjustment to the parking. Removing a third of the parking um, seems to me a very substantial problem here, considering, especially considering uh, the Northwest Highway. I drove by this um, site three times, and two times I thought I was in serious <laughs> harm of, you know, trying to, uh, you know, take a look at this. Um, and with the TMP um, complication also, I mean, it just seems like we're being kind of cavalier about this, and I, I know we're also getting I, I get questions. Are you aware? We got a great deal of um, email in support of this school, but a lot of the support was predicated on the fact that it was going to be a PD, and I'm assuming this current site design, so shoving the school back closer to the neighbors would seem to have some impact on them, and I, I'm certainly not an architect, um, but it seems to me that pushing it back gets you into some trouble with fire lanes and required buffers and that sort of thing. And I would also think that uh, removing a third of the parking and um, suggesting that off-site parking might solve your problem is also tricky because this is not a walkable area. You know, I don't know where these cars are going. And queuing on Northwest Highway would be suicidal. So my basic question is, why is, why is this case in front of us with so many issues unresolved? I'll speak to that one as well. Um, so the applicant's proposal for the PD, uh, their PD conditions, their development plan, their traffic management plan, all of that has been thoroughly reviewed by staff. Uh, David has reviewed their traffic management plan and you know, uh, he has a few comments in the, in the traffic section of the report. Um, but the applicant's proposal is, is essentially in a, a final form that, you know, staff felt was ready to present to the commission. Um, however, staff is, of course, not in support of the applicant's proposal. Instead, we're recommending an alternate scenario that uses an SUP. Uh, and with that, of course, we are recommending our standard conditions for schools, um, like, you know, we do with all SUPs for schools. Um, but, you know, staff is not in the business of, of creating site designs um, and producing site plans um, for these alternative scenarios that we are recommending. Rather, we're recommending uh, revisions to the site plan um, for the applicant and for the commission to consider, um, you know, if they are seeing their way to staff's alternate recommendation. Uh, and I will say, too, um, that I forget exactly when this case was was filed. It was filed earlier this year, and uh, staff and the applicant have met several times, had really extensive discussions um, about this case. We had one particular meeting where the uh, applicant's entire design team was present. The the client for the school was also present, um, where we really you know presented our case. 
Um, you know, the applicant took everything under consideration, um, came back a little while later and said, you know, we appreciate your perspective, but, you know, I think we're going to stick with this, with this PD approach. Um, so that's kind of the history of the case, you know, before coming to CPC. Okay, so following that, so the, the PD did get approved by the um, traffic engineer. Yeah, as far as I know, other than the comments in the traffic section of the report, mm -hmm. uh, the traffic engineer has reviewed the TMP um, and, you know, is, is, is good with, with the version that's included in the report. Um, it, you know, it has the principal's signature, so we know the school is, is on board with it, you know, all that good stuff. Following up, if I may, one question, because uh, you referenced following standard procedures for schools. This school is operating under a permanent SUP at this time, is that correct? That's correct. Okay, but so then... Um, my understanding of the trend in staff's recommendation for schools is to move toward a permanent SUP. If that is the case, why is the is it not a permanent SUP for this particular school? Yeah, I'll, I'll bounce that question to Laquan. Yes, thank you for that. Um, so staff was looking at a non-permanent SUP for this specific case, um, mostly to uh, be able to get certain things implemented within uh, the staff's recommendations. So, for example, the landscaping, right? Um, in order for the buffering to reach mature um, height and age to actually do buffering, it's going to need a few years, right? Um, it's a new site, so they need time to not only um, build and develop the site, but then also implement and install the landscaping. So, in my knowledge and background, that takes about three to five years. Um, building, construction, permitting, that could take, who knows, right, um, a couple years. So we figured doing a 10-year would be more appropriate to allow them time to get everything in order, get things to where it needs to be in terms of uh, the look, feel, and design of the site, and then have them come back um, in front of, you know, the, the, the board, the commission, um, if there were any changes or anything that needed to be uh, done to uh, this new site. Thank you. Yes, please. Sorry, Could I just add with regard to your question about um, the PD proposal having been reviewed by traffic and landscaping and all that? I want to, I just want to clarify that they're, they're looking at the proposal itself in terms of how the traffic is managed and so on they're not approving a pd or sup per se i mean they're basically it's this they're, they're looking at the design the the site plan design right so okay. but it's 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 up to the case manager to determine how that can be accomplished whether it's via sup or pd and so i think i don't i don't want to cross over there and say, you know, David approved it as a PD, but he wouldn't as an SUP. No, my question really meant he, he was approving the conditions gotcha. that were, were set you. in the PD. Thank okay. you, but I appreciate that. Commissioner Hall. <clears throat> Let's see if I can phrase these, this properly. Um, is it correct that if you go the SUP route, that would require the applicant to go to the Board of Adjustment for a couple of critical uh, aspects of this design? No, not necessarily, because again, um, a lot of the things that staff is recommending within the changes to the site or changes to the design, um, those would be compliant. So for prime example, if the, the building was pushed back five feet, that would be in compliance with the base uh, zoning. Um, if the um, uh, the fence was also pushed back to align with, with the front of the building, that would also be in compliance. So they wouldn't need to go to another board or another anybody to get approval, if, if that makes sense. So uh, is it correct there's been some discussion about having to go to the Board of Adjustment for, for things? I think that was the initial thought if they were to continue mo moving forward with the PD and wanting that front, that, that fence to be in that front yard setback. Um, but if we go staff's recommended route of the SUP, they would not need to do that. Am, am I correct that if, if one, one went a PD route though was un with, and the PD would set certain conditions that they would not have to go to a board of adjustment or 
lose parking spaces or anything like that. So if they if they go with a PD, they can write the condition in that would allow that taller fence in the setback. I think Laquan's point is that they could also go the SUP route without having to go to the board if they chose to relocate the fence. It's only if they don't want to comply with the underlying zoning, if they want to have an eight foot fence in the front yard, they can do that. The, the mechanism in place in the base code to do that is to go to the Board of Adjustment. But they can also recess the fence back to the setback line and still have an eight foot fence. Okay. Our, um are you aware that uh, the only access to this site is along Northwest Highway, not along, there are no residential streets adjacent to this property? Yes, I'm aware. Okay. Are you aware that any off-site parking would re require uh, an agreement with Lover's Lane Methodist Church uh, to the north or to Lover Lane, Lover's Lane Methodist properties to the west? Yes, I'm aware. And the uh, if you were to require off-site parking, say, to the north, it would require a shuttle bus to run back and forth uh, because there's no way to cross Northwest Highway or get to this site. Right. If you were to require or uh, off-site off parking to the facility to the west, it would require construction of a pedestrian bridge between the two properties over the creek. That's correct, and that is actually proposed in there site plan yeah it's actually plan. on the site plan that mm -hmm. i'm looking at but it's it's something that could be developed in the future that's correct right but if we went to pd they might be able to get adequate parking on on site without having to do something like that um i, I you are you are aware that there has been extensive uh outreach to neighboring properties along Devonshire Lane. Yes. And am I correct that there's going to be uh, there's going to be some private deed restrictions between the school and those properties perhaps? I have not heard anything about any deed restrictions. Um, and I don't Ryan if you want to speak to that. I don't think you can combine that with the PD. Well, it wouldn't be, I suspect it wouldn't be part of a PD, but they would have some agreement with the neighbors about landscaping, fences, uh, and, and so forth, right? Yeah, and, unless there's other things like some sort of, uh, sometimes there are good neighbor agreements, you know, that, that do not get filed as part of the zoning process. I think they kind of get filed with the council member's office, perhaps. Mm -hmm. um, but, but barring that, the other standards you mentioned for fencing or landscaping or, you know, whatever else, um, all of those are standard conditions that could, um, you know, be included in PD conditions or SUP conditions. Thank it could you. get very um, muddied from a regulation permitting standpoint if we have a PD or SUP that applies to this property plus deed restrictions that may or may not conflict with uh those pd or sup conditions um so just something something to be aware of there but as i heard you commissioner hall you said private deed restrictions and those would be deed restrictions that the city would not enforce uh correct i, I understand that that too <laughs> <laughs> no I, I definitely understand that commissioner can i also clarify the with respect to the parking and it doesn't necessarily need to be in a pd that that could be allowed either that is also something that could be taken care of at the Board of Adjustment. If they truly wanted that parking on site in the setback, they can, that can be part of a board case. This, this really comes down to an issue of, are we going to design based on the regulations in place? Are we going to make an attempt to do that? Or are we going to do a PD so we can get parking and fences in the front yard? Mm -hmm. And that is something that s staff generally, but particularly with schools, has, has shied away from. There's a mechanism in place whereby schools can exist in these uh, zoning districts, and that is an SUP. And then it's up to them to design within the regulations or pursue a board case for these deviations. Okay. And I guess finally, uh, you understand we have a lot of schools, both private and public, in District 13. Um, am I correct that most of those currently operate under PDs? 
I, I, well, actually, I can't speak to that. I can only speak to this specific case. That's sort of a, a trick case. question because yeah. I know I know that they do. Okay. But, <laughs> but to that point, more recently, the ones that have come through have been moved to an SUP rather than a PD. But SUPs with uh, no term limit, is that correct? Um, I think the, the one that I'm thinking of most recently, it kind of happened early on in our school's endeavor, and I think it had a time limit, but it was larger. So, and but so, specific to District 13, I'm thinking of Longfellow, I think. Just to... C commissioners, yes. uh, the discussion of another school's SUP that was approved at some other time is really not relevant to this specific site. Um, I understand, Councillor, it's just providing information. Thank you. And just to, to work another consideration into the mix here, you know, staff's recommendation is for an SUP with a 10-year period. Um, of course, you know, CPC is under no obligation to follow that rec for a 10-year period. If, if the SUP option is still, you know, viable in the eyes of CPC, they could recommend it with a permanent time period rather than the 10 years. Commissioner sure Hampton. Thank you. Um, I just had a couple questions on the site plan. I know I think other commissioners have covered the front yard setback and staff's point of view and other considerations. One question that I didn't hear address is that you'd spoken to the parking. However, the plan that is before us also includes um, a fire lane that is directly within the front yard. And I noticed that the impervious areas called out on the site plan is 65%. Lot coverage is 40. Surface parking doesn't count towards lot coverage. However, with the sensitivity of the creek and the other components of the site, has there been any discussion with the applicant team on alternate materials that would help address that variance? Yes. yes, so this was something that I actually brought up early on with the applicant. Uh, to do as much uh, pervious services as possible. Um, I also actually recommended that they do that for their fire lane. Um, but again, uh, staff can only, you know, do so much. Um, the applicant is going to go forward with what they believe is best for, um, you know, their site, their situation, their proposal. Okay, and then follow-up question, because of the nature of the site, there's a pretty significant grade difference. Um, it certainly seems that would provide an opportunity for maybe doing some tuck under parking or otherwise addressing some of the site constraints that we've been talking through. Was that anything that was um, mentioned by the applicant as they were considering their site plan options? Yes, once again, these are a lot, all the things that I, I looked at and considered um, with this site um, because, again, the biggest thing being if we just do some slight alterations to the design of the site, we can, you know, hit all these check marks, basically. Um, and one of the, uh, I guess one of the challenges is um, the building itself is a fairly large footprint, and we did recommend reducing that um, in, in terms of, I guess, the width and maybe going up a story because technically they could go up higher in height. Um, there are no restrictions to the height for an institutional use. So they could go another story, another two stories, reduce that footprint and possibly have parking underneath or, you know, do some sort of uh, alternate design to address um, many of the things that we are speaking on today. Thank you. I'm sure the community would have a point of view if they were looking um, at significant height increases. But again, because of the grade, it just seemed like there might be some other opportunity. So thank you, Mr. Clinton. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Any other questions on this item, commissioners? Okay. I just wanted yes, to sir. also add, so it's, it's not, so it's, staff is in support of the use, right? So the, the private school use, but staff is just recommending a different method to get that use. Thank you, sir. Uh, commissioners, let's go back and pick up the two number, uh, the two district seven cases. So we'll go to the, the next one. I think it's, which is, um, Number 16, and then we'll go back and pick up the other D7 case. Mm -hmm. 
me again. Sorry. It's you. I'm telling you. I told you to make yourself comfortable up there. All right, this is item number 16, case Z234-264. It's an application for an MF1 multifamily subdistrict on property zoned ACC Community Commercial Subdistrict within Plan Development District number 595, the South Dallas Fair Park Special Purpose District on the southeast line of Spring Avenue, southwest of the intersection of Spring Avenue and Pine Spring Connection. The purpose of the request is to rezone the property to, MF, to an MF1A multifamily district and allow duplex uses. Um, the site is approximately right under 6,000 square feet in total size. Um, again, currently zoned PD 595 with the community commercial subdistrict one. It's an undeveloped lot. Um, this lot has frontage on Spring Avenue. It is located in uh, South Dallas Fair Park neighborhood, about four miles from downtown. Uh, the purpose is to request, uh, I'm sorry, the purpose of the request is to rezone for duplex uses. Applicant is proposing a new duplex uh, totaling 28 feet in height. Uh, there's only been one zoning case in the immediate area within the last five years, and this is a general zoning change. Here is the location map. Here is our aerial map. And this is the zoning map showing the surrounding uses um, uh, everywhere to the, sorry, the immediate adjacencies are uh, PD 595. To the north is commercial retail and single family. To the east is uh, single family. And to the south, uh, also single family and commercial retail. Here we have the site visit photos. This is on site looking southeast. This is on site looking northeast. This is on site looking southwest. This is on site looking southwest again. This is looking to the surrounding uses. Uh, this is north northwest. <clears throat> this is looking northeast. Uh, brief development standards chart. So the existing zone is PD 595 with subdistrict uh, CC subdistrict one. Uh, the front yard setback is none or 15 feet. Um, there are some nuances within this PD, um, but that is the front yard requirement. Um, so the side and rear would be uh, 15 feet adjacent to residential and none or five feet uh, if adjacent to other. So the none or insert uh, the the foot the uh, the feet there is I guess because within the PD it's not required but if it is provided then the minimum um, requirement would be the uh, for example the, the front yard would be the 15 feet and for the side and rear yard it would be the five feet uh, so the height uh, max height would be 54 feet at four stories um, and then for the proposed uh, zone, they uh, the applicant is requesting an MF1. Uh, the front yard setback will be 15 feet. The side and rear yard uh, setbacks would be, uh, if adjacent to a duplex, five or 10 feet. If adjacent to other uses, 10 or 15 feet. But because the immediate adjacencies are uh, residential, um, single family, the requirement would be uh, none and then the max height would be 36 feet. So a uh, brief staff analysis, the existing surrounding uh, uh, uses include residential, single family, and directly adjacent to the, uh, which are directly adjacent to the subject site. Uh, the request does fit within the existing uses of the immediate surrounding area and block face continuity would be imposed. The area request does comply with um, various uh, comprehensive plans and specifically the Hatcher Station area plan. Therefore, staff's recommendation is approval. Thank you, sir. Questions, Commissioner Hampton? I just had a general comment or question, excuse me. 
it, do I understand correctly? This is currently within PD 595 and the request is to remove this lot from PD 595. Am I understanding that correctly? N no. So it would, it would remain within 595, but basically we are, we would, um, change the sub district to a, uh, MF, so MF you're, one. you're creating a single sub district within this to accommodate a duplex development. Thing. No, we're not creating anything. We're just changing the current sub district from CC to MF one, which is allowed under PD 595. Okay. And it's adjacent to a duplex sub district. It is adjacent to a du duplex sub district, but however, the use on that lot is not a duplex. Okay. I, thank you. It's complicated there. It's, it's very, complicated very, very, there. Yeah. <laughs> That's why we love PD 595. Uh, <laughs> uh, Commissioner Carpenter, please. So the only way to do a duplex on this lot, uh, you can't do duplex zoning because you don't have the 6,000 square feet. MF1 would make it 3,000 minimum. And, okay. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's um, the handcuffs, the handcuffs, yeah. Uh, any other questions on this item? Commissioner Wheeler, uh, my apologies, I don't see you online, so I appreciate that. Commissioner Wheeler. We can't hear you. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Um, are you are are you aware that any um, any cases that we, um, that are related to housing that we ask the planners to also um, loop in long the long term planning team who uh, is working in this area with the community on any type of housing um, any type of um, zoning changes that will relate related to housing. Commissioner yes. Wheeler, um, our long range planners do attend our internal staff review meeting, the ZRT zoning review team meeting. Um, so they're involved in all of our cases already. So specifically, Lindsay, so was specifically Lindsay and Patrick in those meetings? Um, if they weren't, um, some of their colleagues were. Okay. Well, specifically, well, let me be more, um, so specifically Lindsay and, and, um, was Lindsay and Patrick there, not the colleague, those two, who was actually working with, uh, with it, working with the community on PD 595 and they've requested. And also I sent out a general email to, so I sent an email to all the heads related to this because of these type of situations. Yeah, like I said, we, we don't take attendance on our internal staff review meeting, um, but we do uh, invite long range planners to attend and give our zoning case planners any comments on our cases uh, from a long range planning lens. Um, so our long range planners were given the opportunity to participate in the review of this zoning case. Okay, could okay. you just, just pause one so, second, uh, Commissioner? We, we have to make sure that we can see you and, and apparently the screens here are not showing you. Can you see her, you Commissioner Black? Okay, but I think we're supposed to see her at one of these. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, the public needs to be able to Okay, see. just pause one second. I'm, the picture, oh. I'm on. I'm, y'all can see me? We, we, yeah, we, okay, now we can see you on the, yeah, we, we have to show you on the screens to the public and they weren't being shown. Okay, Commissioner, please continue. Okay. Thank you. So, I was, um, so um, there, were you, uh, were you aware that there was concerns because of the, the lot size? of the duplexes being proposed that uh, that was expressed to the applicant? I'm sorry, can you repeat that? Were you aware that there was a, that because of the lot size that it was a, that there was a concern and it was told to the applicant that? Uh, I was not. Um, yeah. So we, there is, again, that's the reason why we want Lindsay and Patrick moved in. Um, so, um, it, are you, so, uh, so for a matter of fact, this case is actually going to be held because we need to have community meetings. Are you, um, but the immediate community, were you aware that the reason 
that the the square footage of the uh, duplex lots in South Dallas proposed uh, to six thousand is to avoid these um, sub districts. I uh, was not lots. aware. So, I just want to clarify. So we're not. It's not a duplex. Uh, we're not changing. The applicant is not going from a CC subdistrict to a duplex subdistrict. They're going to an MF1 subdistrict to allow duplex uses because of the uh, the lot size. So were you speaking to that or? Yes. Okay. And then, the P, were you aware that the PD five nine five set up those six thousand one the, the, the ones who created PD five nine five and those who are continuing to work on PD five with five nine five or the six thousand square foot was what they wanted for minimum. Yeah. Right, and so because the site is right under six thousand, that's part part of the reason why the request is. Uh, well, actually, that is the majority of the reason why the request is not going to a duplex subdistrict, but going to an MF1 subdistrict um, to allow for uh, the duplex use. Bec because that lot is not meeting the duplex subdistrict lot size requirement of 6,000 square feet. Okay, um, I'm going to ask this case to be held. We, we, we need to loop in. I need to ensure that the, uh, lot, the lot, those who are working with this community in long term planning is to properly fit this case and also the community. Yeah, I, before we move on, I can kind of speak to that question a little bit more. Commissioner Wheeler, I think you're kind of zooming out a little bit there. Um, yeah, no, I, I, we all understand that. Um, you know, the South Dallas area plan is currently in the process of being revised. Um, however, just to play referee for a little bit, um, until an update to that area plan has been adopted by council and becomes council adopted policy, we in current planning um, cannot consider, cannot factor into our consideration of zoning cases any kind of policies or implementation steps that may come out of that area plan. Um, that the, that's kind of just you know the rules we have to play by. Just like you know we may have a new updated comprehensive plan in the near future, but uh, until that plan becomes council adopted policy, we are not able as zoning staff to consider that uh, when we announce when we analyze cases. So I'm not referring to I understand that, and I'm not referring to what is about to happen. Though even though that the area plan is going through a revising period. We are the reason that I'm asking them to be looped in because the community meetings that we are having is asking uh, along with what is currently in PD 595 that and that we're on the brink of gentrification that all housing related cases be vetted by both our long term planners and our community before moving in. And I have sent out at least two emails looping in all uh, both Andrea and Andrea. And um, Lieutenant, I mean, Director Lou, and both our planners, and I believe also you, Ryan, that these be that that the community be involved in all housing um, related cases. And that is right. Everything. And and that the way that plugs into current planning staff's uh, policies and procedures is that our long range planners are given the opportunity to inter to uh, participate in our internal staff review meetings on all of our zoning cases. Uh, that's their opportunity to give us feedback, like the feedback you're describing. Um, so, so that did happen with this case as it does uh, with all others. Okay, so again, we're gonna hold this case in any cases that come up in this manner as housing related, we need to make sure it's properly rated by the community. And I can tell you this case was not. Yeah, and I, I, I think the angle you're, you're coming from, I would recommend you speak with uh, Patrick and Lindsay um, about that. Okay. All right. So we will be holding, we'll hold this case until. Um, Commissioner until Wheeler, uh, this is not on the consent agenda, so you can hold it, but it would have to happen at the 12th, after the, during okay. the public hearing after 1230. Okay, thank you. To, to what date, Commissioner? The first uh, meeting in November. November? Yes. Okay. That's November 21st. The 20th, the first one? 
Oh, okay. I don't have that on my calendar. Somebody built. Do we do have one on the seventh? We'll double check. November seventh, then. If you get it wrong, you got eight people telling you. <laughs> <laughs> Very quickly, too. Okay, then let's go back to the other uh, D7 case. I think it's number 12. Yeah. That's what I'm thinking. Where's my chair? I've been up here like an hour now. Okay, number 12, KZ234-174. Oops, let me share, sorry. KZ234-174, an application for a TH3 townhouse subdistrict on property zone in R5A, single family subdistrict within plan development district number 595 the South Dallas Fair Park Special Purpose District on the northwest side of Hurling Street between South 2nd Avenue and Cross Street. The purpose of the request is to rezone the property to, to TH3 um, to allow residential uses, approximately 25,000 square feet in total size. Uh, the area of request is currently zoned R5A, single family subdistrict, um, currently undeveloped lots and located within the South Dallas neighborhood. So it's three consecutive lots on a residential block with frontage on Hurling Street. Uh, there's been one zoning case in the immediate area within the last five years. Again, the purpose of the request is to rezone the property to TH3. Um, the applicant is requesting a general zoning change. Um, applicant has also volunteered D restrictions to height, front yard setback, and lot coverage. Um, this case was held under advisement uh, from the July 11th CPC, and there have been no changes to the case since then. Here's our location map. Here's our, our aerial map. And this is the zoning map showing the surrounding uses. Uh, to the north is PD-595, single family. To the east, PD-595, single family. To the south, commercial retail. Um, all of it is PD-595, but to the south is uh, commercial retail and to the west commercial retail. This is on Hurling Street, uh, looking northeast. Uh, this is on site, looking northeast. This is on Hurling Street, looking northwest. Uh, this uh, Hurling Street, looking southwest. Same position looking at the surrounding uses, so uh, southeast. This is on site looking south. And this is at the intersection looking at some of the surrounding uses, uh, the commercial retail. Uh, same location at the intersection looking northwest to the surrounding uses. Uh, development standards, so existing, uh, the existing zoning is R5A, 20-foot uh, front yard setback, 5-foot uh, rear and side yard setback, 30-foot max height. Um, due to the block face uh, being divided by two or more zoning districts, the front yard for the entire block face must comply with the requirements of the district with the greatest front yard requirement. So that means... Uh, the lots uh, in the area of request would be subject to a 20-foot front yard setback uh, due to the immediate adjacency of the R5A uh, subdistrict lots. The proposed zoning would be TH3. So the front, uh, front yard setback, uh, the requirement in the TH3 is zero. However, again, due to block face continuity, they would, be, uh, they would have that 20-foot front yard setback imposed. Uh, the side and rear uh, 
setbacks are uh, zero uh, due to the immediate adjacencies to single family. And the uh, max height allowed is 36 feet. But again, the applicant is volunteering deed restrictions to limit the max height. Um, again, the, the volunteer deed restrictions um, limiting the max height to 30 feet to match the existing uh, fabric of the, uh, the immediate block. Uh, the 20 foot front yard setback and then reduce lot coverage to match the R5A sub district lot coverage of 45%. Uh, residential buffers will be required on the boundary of the site that is directly adjacent to the existing commercial uses, which would be the, I believe the west, the northwest of the site. Uh, the proposed use would be appropriate in the immediate area and on the, uh, in the immediate uh, block and staff uh, supports the applicant's request and finds the proposed rezoning to be appropriate for the area as it would fit the existing fabric of the neighborhood. Uh, additionally, the applicant is volunteering deed restrictions to um, make sure, ensure that the future development would uh, fit within this immediate area, um, as well as the com compatibility with the surrounding area. Uh, and the request is found to be appropriate here as there um, is a zoning uh, there's a duplex uh, on the same block, I think maybe two two houses up, or I'm sorry, directly adjacent to the subject site. Uh, so staff recommendation is approval subject to D restrictions volunteered by the applicant. Thank you, sir. Questions? Commissioner Wheeler. Commissioner Wheeler, please. Were you, were you aware that there was a meeting um, with, the, with staff and this applicant um, concerning um, um, his application? I was. I am aware. Um, um, are you also aware that is there any reason why he wasn't why a duplex uh, um, why why duplex uh, zoning wasn't um, considered because of the previous because of what's in the area already? Yes. So similar to the previous case that was presented, the lots do not meet the um, the lot size requirement. So that's why the applicant is going with the TH3 instead of the, the duplex. Uh, There's base. also the block phase continu continuity. And, yes, and also the block phase continu continuity coming into play and being imposed on the um, proposed lots uh, was a consideration for the, to go with the TH3. And he's proposing duplexes on each lot I believe that would be best suited for the applicant. I'm not aware of that, uh, the intent of the, I guess the development for each lot. So what, 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 was, what all could he have in a TH1 zoning? In terms of the uses? Yes. Uh, single family or duplex? Single family or duplex. Um, there's the rest of the question that I asked the applicant because we did have quite a long, uh, we had a meeting with city, city staff, both uh, council office and uh, planners um, to better understand his, his bill. But we'll, we, I guess we'll finish this at the extra bill. All right, thank you. Commissioner Hampton. Thank you. So. This is actually a question that's kind of been percolating. I think this is probably the time to ask it. So we've got two cases, both in PD 595. Both are trying to do duplex infill housing. One's in R5 district, one was in a commercial zone district. We're coming up with different solutions to try to address what is fundamentally just an infill housing. This is a PD. Has there been a consideration of creating a new modified duplex infill housing subdistrict that would be able to address the specific requirements for the lot size, for the um, setbacks? I know we've done this in other PDs where they are essentially tailored to meet the existing conditions on the ground. Would that not be a solution that would bring some continuity to how these are being implemented? Yeah, I, second that. I think that's a wonderful idea. 
Um, however, the task before us right now with this item is to evaluate if this zoning proposal is appropriate for this piece of property. Um, however, I sincerely hope that Commissioner Wheeler was listening closely to <laughs> everything you just said. Well, and, and I, but I guess, I mean, we're creating a subdistrict. Is it a function of the fact that a TH3, in this case, subdistrict, already exists, so it simply is changing the designation in lieu of creating? But, I mean, I guess what I don't understand is why couldn't it be a recommendation for a new subdistrict? Yeah, so, so I, there's a confusion in terminology that's coming into play uh, that's present in PD 595 as well as PD 193. Um, when we say subdistrict here, we don't mean, you know, like a subdistrict one or a sub subdistrict A or, or, or something like a subset of regulations within a PD. Uh, what we mean here with a TH3A townhouse subdistrict is it's essentially a base subdistrict within PD 595. This is also present in um, PD 193. So the current, uh, it's kind of a base district within the PD. So the current base district for this property today is R5. So it follows all the standard regulations of R5. Am I not getting at your question? I think I understand all that and I'm trying to pull up PD 595 because it's not in the case report, but I think you've answered my question. So thank you. Thank you. Any other questions, commissioners? Commissioner Wheeler, second around, please. Um, to answer that question, you know, in a question format, um, Mr. Monkey, are, are you aware that some of those considerations are being um, considered to, um, in the, the changes, the updates to the area plan in the future? Um, so. I know we're phrasing these as questions, but this is starting to sound like jeopardy and turn into discussion of things beyond just this one zoning case. Um, I don't know if one of the attorneys feels compelled to get on the mic, but they're nodding their head at what I'm saying, so maybe they don't need to. Okay. So, um, well, are you aware, um, are you all aware that the reason um, th this case uh, is on consent is because of and, and the issue within PD five within Dallas period is the, that the, the once we once we allow for the zoning case, we in the general zoning case we're not allowed to um, consider design standards. The the question was design standards related the to the reason this case is because of the the. the the issue is more that we can't consider design standards in this particular case. I, I don't know if this is the answer to your question. I will say that in the past when we've had uh, cases similar to this, uh, where we're kind of doing an infill housing solution, um, applicants have volunteered deed restrictions in addition to the general zoning change. Uh, those deed restrictions could be used to require some design standards. Uh, on the property, uh, only if the applicant were willing to volunteer those standards. Okay, I'm on my way to the office there. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, members, any other questions on this one? All right, I think that we don't have anything else to brief, do we? All right, it is 12:13. Um, and that concludes the briefing of the Dallas City Plan Commission. We will be back for our public hearing, and we will try to get on the record for that at 12.45 p.m. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>